for lysogenic infection, the greater black or morlytic infection. And we can see that these spread out. And this makes sense, and we've done other genomic analyses that, that hold true with this. But now we can take this spatial information and ask what environmental variables explain this. And we can overlay that. And what you start to see is that there's indicators in the nutrients, in nitrogen and phosphorus, um, as well as total dissolved solids of pH, that may suggest there are controls on whether the cell makes a lytic or lysogenic decision once it's infected. This is pretty exciting to us, especially if um, lysogeny helps the blooms continue to grow with some sort of new potential. But all of this requires extra experimental validation. And so that's what we plan to do. In fact, in August of this year, uh, I took two grad students and we went over to China. And we went over to China just as a tropical storm was descending on Lake Tidal. So unfortunately, we haven't been able to validate this yet in the field, um, but we're hoping to validate it in Lake Erie next summer. But we've gone deeper than this. And I said earlier on, you don't just have to look at one population. You can look at whatever you want in the system. So my student, Lena Pound, decided she wanted to look at what she calls the neglected viruses. Viral ecologists love to study viruses for the most dominant organism in the system, because there's lots of those viruses there. It makes it really easy. And our microcystis lytic phage and microcystis lysogenic phage are down here. The greens are high copy number for transcripts. Lots of that type of infection. Blacks and reds are low copy number for that transcripts. What Lena has pulled out of this data set is situations you can see up here where we have lots of markers for NCLDVs. These are the giant viruses, the Mimiviridae that infect amoeba, they infect single cell eukaryotic algae, um, but she's also pulled out a ton of single stranded RNA virus signatures that infect things like diatoms and grazers. And in fact, when she's done the phylogenetic workup of these viruses, they primarily appear to be similar to viruses that might be infecting copepods or chytrids. So what does all this tell us here? Well, this suggests to us, and this is a brand new area of research for us, is that there may be some sort of predatory prey cascade going on at the microbial level. But we see things like part of iridae, which can infect chytrids, and chytrids can either attack diatoms or fragment microcystis. But we see things like Dicistraviridae, which can infect invertebrate grazers that eat algae. So we're starting to see that there's these feedback loops at the microbial level that are really complicated in how we think about just adding nutrients and getting things to grow. So that's sort of part one of my presentation. The second part is I want to go back to that mention of nitrogen I made earlier. Something we've been doing for a few years is looking at different nitrogen sources. Now for decades we've looked at nitrate and ammonia, um, about six or seven years ago, many of us started to consider urea as a possible nitrogen source in these systems. This plot here kind of illustrates that. This is from a paper that we put out with Hans Perl a couple of years ago, um, looking at ammonia nitrate as fertilizer use in the U.S. versus urea. It's pretty clear that urea use is going up in the system. And of course, urea, uh, through the activity of urease, can be a very good nitrogen source for algae. There's a lot of data now out there suggesting that this is actually going on in the system. Uh, Justin Chafin, Tim Davis, Schaefer Bilal in my lab have all shown that urea will stimulate biomass accumulation in samples collected in Lake Erie. Schaefer went further to characterize the activity of the urease enzyme and show that there's a turnover rate that ranges from minutes to days. And in fact, during the peak of the bloom in August, the turnover rate is about half an hour. It's longer if you average it over the summer. And finally, Morgan Stephan went ahead and looking at that same data from the Toledo event, was able to show that urea assimilation is active in microcystis during blooms, and the pathways involved in urea production are not active. These cells are taking up and using urea during bloom events. In the lab, we validated this. <coughs> Laura Krausfeld, some of you might have met her at SIL, has gone in and shown that N15 from urea is directly incorporated into a xenic microcystis using metabolomics. So what we do here is we feed urea with 15 nitrogen in, replacing 14 nitrogen in the cells, and we measure all the different metabolites, and we look and see where the urea is incorporated. What's interesting about this is that we see the urea actually goes into different biochemical pathways while it's relative to ammonia, and relative to nitrate, and of particular interest to us is the marked incorporation of nitrogen from urea uh, into arginine. 
Now, about two months ago, somebody proposed, they beat us to the punch in uh, a PICA cyanobacterium, that arginine might be a storage molecule for nitrogen. And we're, we're seeing the same thing here. We're hoping to validate that really soon. The other thing that uh, Lauren is seeing is that cells grown on urea are much more toxic than cells grown on nitrate or ammonia. What you're looking at here is a plot, um, time and hours, microcystin in femtograms per cell, and then this is a log scale plot here, and you can clearly see the green bars, which are cells grown on urea, are probably close to two orders of magnitude more toxic than the cells grown on nitrate or ammonia. And while this is interesting to me, this isn't actually what I wanted to get to in this story. Because for about 10 years, I've always wondered one simple thing. Could urea serve as a carbon source too? Uh, there's been a couple of paper la papers lately that have alluded to this, paper at Charlie Tricks group, and many people have suggested that when consuming urea, you free up a carbon as CO2, and that cells growing under extreme conditions may want to use this carbon. But no one's ever actually measured this, and no one's actually ever quantified how important this might be. So why do we think this is important? Well, you've all seen this. This is taken right out of Wetzel. And we're looking at um, the effect of pH on different species of organic carbon. And what we've drawn on here is our pH ranges for blooms we see where microcystis is growing. And what you can see is that even at the lowest pHs, where we see microcystis, dissolved CO2 is vanishingly low. Now we talk about microcystis getting around this by able, being able to use carbonic anhydrase and pump bicarbonate into the cells. But that's rather energy expensive. And if there was an easier way to do this, to pick up something that was maybe a waste product, you would want to do that instead. One question we might have though is does this you know, have an effect in nature? So what Lauren started with was she pulled some data from um, buoys that are out in Lake Erie, averaged them over the days, and then looked at phycocyanin, our marker for cyanobacteria, and pH in the system. And while we see these interesting day-by-day -day relationships up here, if we plot them against each other, we see relatively strong relationships, relatively strong abilities to predict pH, or predict phycocyanin, from pH. So in the lab she went in and she repeated the nitrogen experiment but this time with labeled urea. She took C12 grown cells, she transferred them to C13 urea, let them go for seven days, and um, in this situation, the cells are growing at a rate of about 0.2 per day. So this is about one and a half doublings, and that becomes important. She then filtered the cells and extracted the metabolites, and asked the question, do I see incorporation of carbon from urea into the system? And I'm frozen. Nope, that's not it. All right, the data slide is gone. It was there when I checked it at one thirty. in the cell, hopefully way at the back back there, you can see these green dots here. These are all different metabolites where we found carbon <coughs> incorporated from urea in pathways in microcystis. <coughs> On the bottom here, and I wish this was bigger, what we're looking at is the amount of each of this selection of metabolites that has C13 instead of C12. Why is this important? Well, some of these metabolites um, 
but these down here, almost 50% of the metabolite has C13 carbon instead of C12 carbon. Now remember I said that they had about one to one and a half doublings during this period, so they basically had enough time to double their carbon. This suggests that almost all of the carbon under these conditions in the lab was incorporated from urea, it was not incorporated from CO2. Let's see if I can get back into the slide I kept wanting to show. Teaching four days a week is you get really used to this. <laughs> okay, so could this actually happen in nature? Let's think about this for a second. How do we do this calculation? Well, if we assume Redfield, carbon and nitrogen in a 7 1 ratio, so two nitrogen for every carbon, and if the cell is getting all of its nitrogen from urea, that releases enough carbon to make up about 7% of the cell's carbon requirement for that day. 7% doesn't sound like a lot, by the way, just for the record. Um, but it is releasing this 7% in a pathway that should be energy, energetically much more favorable than pumping bicarbonate. And there's one other catch to this, too. You can get the next slide to show. Okay, so what we're looking at here is we've gone back to that buoy data. And now we're plotting it at uh, one minute increments. And you're looking at uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight days in Lake Erie. You're looking at pH here. Um, for those of you at the back, this is pH 9. Up here is pH 9.7. These are the common pHs we see during microcystis blooms. But what I want you to take away from this is there's massive pH spikes that occur. Most afternoons by the end of the solar day during these microcystis blooms. And these pH spikes go from regions where CO2 is vanishingly low the CO2 is probably not existent in the water column. So during these periods of time here, it is quite possible that urea is providing most of the carbon for microcystis in the system. Now, of course, at this point, this is completely a hypothesis, but we're hoping to go out next summer um, and actually test this using the same approaches, similar approaches. So all of that said, uh, I want to talk about one more thing, slides be willing. Sure, I wanted to put in a parting word about temperature. So I've talked about viruses, talked about nitrogen, but I want to put in one thing about temperature because it's really important. I've done a lot of work on temperature lately. Uh, Sonny Peng and Robbie Martin just published a really nice paper in Environmental Science and Technology a couple months ago uh, where they looked very closely at the effect of different nitrogen sources and different temperatures. And all of this arose because their backup cultures that they left sitting on a bench in the lab behaved very differently than the cultures they put in the controlled incubators. And they realized the only difference was temperature, and as they chased this through, and this cost me about two years of salary for each of them, <coughs> um, but they were able to find these relationships. One relationship is one we already know. Increasing temperatures from 18 to 22 to 28, 6 to 30 degrees lead to increases in specific growth rates of microcystis. We know that to be true, lots of people have published on this, but this relationship is dependent on the nitrogen source you give the cells. The relationship changes if you go from nitrate to urea. One thing that is all over the literature that people don't seem to know is that as you go from 18 degrees up to 30 degrees, microcystis cells become less toxic per cell. This is completely independent of the nitrogen source. We're looking at here cells growing on nitrate, cells growing on urea, and I will point out that cells grown on urea at these lower temperatures are really unhappy. We cannot get enough biomass in any of our experiments, and we think we know why, to generate um, enough biomass to make measurements. But you can see this very strong relationship here, and I should have put the stats on here, I apologize, but they are in the paper. But cells are less toxic. This is on a per cell basis. I need to point that out. Because now we have this problem of cells growing faster and accumulating more biomass at higher temperatures, 
but being less toxic. So it is possible that under higher temperatures you can get more toxin by producing a lot more cells. Again, this is all through the literature. It goes back into the 60s. We all seem to have ignored it. And in fact, Robbie built this lovely table um, making a summary of the literature that he put in the supplemental information for this paper. So where does it take me to? Well, it takes me to the one point that I apparently don't know how to use PowerPoint very well. Um, but the other point is that understanding these blooms, it's complicated. It's not nitrogen. It's not phosphorus. It's not carbon. It's not viruses. It's a variety of different things. And understanding how we get different phytoplankton populations is very complicated. And we need to begin to accept this. We have tools now where we can start to take this apart and generate new hypotheses. But there's a lot of work to do there. And, and hopefully we're going to be able to do that. And there's one other thing that comes out of all these observations. These cells are not happy. They're not growing particularly joyfully. They're not proliferating like crazy. They're effectively surviving. And maybe it's not about who can grow better out there, but who can simply survive better under all these pressures than their competition. So all that said, I have worked with a bunch of amazing people. Um, some of them are here. Uh, students Morgan Steffen, Lauren Krausfeld, Josh Stow, uh, Lena Pound, Robbie Martin, and Sonny Peng did a lot of work with you Saturday. And I think I have time for a couple questions. <laughs> Yes, we have plenty of time for questions, so please go ahead. Okay, I can start. <laughs> so the first question for me. Uh, thank you, Stephen, for this fantastic talk. Um, you, in the introduction, you show that uh, these microcystins are a problem for mammals because of accumulation and toxicity and so on. But what about their impact for other microbes? Yeah, that's a, that, that's a really interesting question because there's a lot of different data out there. Um, some people have shown that if you add microcystin, it causes oxidative stress. Um, we published an experiment about a year ago where we did this in E. coli, which is our model for everything microbial. We know what most of the genes are doing. We did uh, high throughput sequencing of the transcriptomes. We did physiological analyses. We could find no effect of microcystin um, on these cells. We did this in a high number of replicates. Um, we were very disappointed when we didn't find an effect, so we did it again and again and again. And we simply don't find an effect. We think that whatever microsystem is doing, it's acting as some sort of uh, internal regulatory mechanism. Some people talk about nitrogen storage. Some people talk about oxidative stress. Whatever it's doing, it's doing for microcystis or the organisms that are making it. The fact that it's a toxin is just happenstance, I guess, really. OK. Uh, do you think that? Uh it means that there's no allelo allelopathy with that kind of molecules, for instance? Uh, and again, we've only done this with E. coli. I'm guessing if we could work with more closely related organisms, we would see a bigger effect. Right now we're working with um, knockouts that have had some of the microcystin synthesis genes knocked out. So we're adding it back to microcystis, comparing them and asking the question, um, how does the presence of microcystin influence microcystis that can make the toxin versus one that can't? Uh, and then we'll move slowly farther away to Simicococcus, Simicocystis, Sanabana, whatever. So I, I think the answer's out there. I think we just have to look really deep. Please. George. So uh, you talk about uh, survival and how the communities changes based on uh, the change of it. So is there anyone really looking at uh, how high pH may suppress other organisms? It seems like if... Uh, Microcystis is raising the pH of 9.7. That's created a nice environment for its better environment for itself than anybody else. Yeah, diatoms definitely don't like pHs over nine. Um, although there's not a lot of literature on that, so I have a student recreating that in my lab right now. Um, there's also changes to nitrogen speciation that happen around 9.3. Looking at Mark here, I think ammonia switches to ammonium. That other way around, ammonium, I can never get that right. Um, but that switch occurs around 9.3, that's really gonna influence some of the organisms that are there. Um, I think trying to understand how microcystis can create an environment that it can just survive in but exclude everybody else um, is a direction that's, that's worth looking at.
Thanks, Steve. That, that was really great. Um, when you were talking about transcriptomes, you, you made the point that this is telling us about what the cells are trying to do. Does that mean you think that it's not really telling us what they're doing? And, and does it, do you think that there's a, there's a bottleneck of translation or, or some other downstream process? So if you go to the molecular biology meetings, there's always the hot debate thing between the people who work on transcripts, the people who work on proteins, and the people who work on metabolites. The ones who are really doing the real science, as they'll argue. Um, for me, it's about regulation. And I think that whatever cells are trying to do is what they most recently perceived in the environment. So transcripts in E. coli turnover in about 20 minutes. That's fairly well studied. In other systems, it may be 30 minutes or a bit longer. Proteins turn over on scales of hours to days. Um, metabolites, we, we simply don't know. So when I say that we're figuring out what the cells are trying to do, they're probably doing that, but there is that 20-minute window where they could have shut off the transcripts and said, oh, I've got enough of whatever I want. I don't need that anymore. You know, at the same time, when we look at these balloons, we never see nitrogen transport turned off. We never see phosphorus transport turned off. We never see carbon transport turned off. Everything is fully expressed, fully turned on. So um, I'm actually surprised they maybe haven't lost that ability to regulate these things. But integration time is important. Integration time is really important, but we're talking on minutes now. So that, and that's why we like transcripts. We can also um, look more broadly across the community using transcripts. One of the problems with proteomics is you need a really good search database. Um, you can't really use homology with proteomics the way they do it. Um, so that's why we like transcriptomes, because if we can't figure out exactly what we have, we can get darn close. An example I'll give is that every time we look at a lake, we see something that looks like trichodesmian, which is a well-known marine cyanobacteria. We have no idea what this organism is. It's abundant. It shows up in lakes all the time. It looks like trichodesmium at a genomic level. Maybe somebody in this room knows what it is, but we sure don't, but we see it everywhere we look. So the question was that we know lots about the energetics of a nitrogen assimilation except for for urea. Um, I do not know the answer to that. The energetics of urea have been worked out in a couple systems, but nothing that resembles cyanobacteria that I know of. I do know that if somebody was to work that out, it would be really nice um, if they would account for the carbon they're getting as a bonus. Because that's energy being saved down the road. <coughs> Thank you for this wonderful talk. I just want to double check if I understood correctly. Uh, you showed us that for lysogenic infection, you basically observed high uptake rates for nutrients in cyanobacteria. Is that true? Or did I get it wrong? For lysogen infection? Yeah, no, I didn't link nutrient uptake with um, lysogeny. I did suggest that lysogeny was happening um, during the part of the season where we see the most biomass, we see sort of the peak of the bloom. And we just had a paper come out which adds to this story last week in Environmental Science and Technology from Shaman Tong, where he showed at that point of the season, microcystis goes from a rapidly growing phenotype to a phenotype where the cells are just maintaining themselves in the system. And they're changing hundreds of genes around in terms of their expression to do this. So I did link it to that, but we haven't actually tied together cause and effect. That's something we're thinking, you've read my mind, but we haven't been able to tie lysogeny to this switch over to limb maintenance. I was just wondering if it would change cellular spectrometry and stuff. Yeah, so we published a, a paper with Jose um, Cover and Joshua Weitz's group a couple years ago in Nature Reviews Microbiology. We talked about the fact that virus particles have a very different stoichiometry than bacterial particles or cyanobacterial particles. And so if you're making a lot of virus, if you're producing virus, it does change stoichiometry. However, if you're a lysogen, basically you're just making a little extra DNA, so it probably does not change stoichiometry at that point. Yes, in the back. Last question. 
Thanks, Steve. Always good to hear about my sisters. Um, one question. Do you think the mayor of Toledo was right in switching off the tap? Scientifically speaking? I'm a scientist, but I try to really avoid those policy decisions. That's just science. Yeah, uh, from just from the science, um, from what I heard at the time, probably, from what I've heard since then, I'm not so sure. And that's something we can talk about that's not going out on YouTube <laughs> over a period. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, too. Okay, so let's move to the next talk. Thanks, Tim. So that will be given by Dr. George Burlington. cyanobacterial bloomage plagues, uh, near shore environments uh, in, the, in the lower Great Lakes and river uh, and, uh, um, and tributaries, and uh, try to explain uh, why Plankothrix thrives in these environments as opposed to microcystis, and perhaps we can come up with some uh, a general mechanism that would predict uh, Plankothrix success in, in, other, in other regions. So uh, I'd also like to thank, in addition to my co-authors, thank a number of other folks who have worked with us, uh, Sylvia Newell uh, uh, at Wright State, uh, her student Justina uh, Hampel have been uh, extremely helpful to us. Uh, I didn't add Mark McCarthy here, I apologize for that, but he is a, uh, he's a just as important member of that group. And, uh, but uh, today, uh, when you talk about Lake Erie, and people, uh, people do in my country for the fifth, uh, they talk about the microcystis blooms that happen offshore uh, pretty much every year, uh, and this, this was responsible for the Toledo water crisis. Yet, uh, there's a near shore bloom which is less uh, widely spoken of, which is due to, uh, to plankton. And they're two very different organisms. They both produce microcystin, uh, yielding the problems that, that we see uh, and the challenges that are, that are uh, that, um, water treatment plants have to deal with. Now, one thing uh, we see, uh, if you look at the satellite images, the, the MODIS and MERIS satellite images of, of Lake Erie over the, 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 in, during the century, you'll see that there's a high variability of There's a high variability of uh, microcystis blooms, which is actually linked to the uh, amount of nutrients, agricultural nutrients, which are, are come down the Maumee River over here every spring. If you have a dry year, the, uh, the summertime bloom is low. If you have a wet spring, the uh, summertime bloom can be quite intense. And these are the two worst blooms we've ever seen. This planktothrix bloom behaves very differently. Every single year, irrespective of uh, whether it's a rainy spring or not, you get these high levels of bloom. So they clearly behave differently just at, at first glance. Now if we look at the differences uh, between uh, the microcystis and plankothrix blooms, everything pretty much on this list is different except for the second point here. They both produce microcystin, typically above the EPA and WHO contact advisories. Uh, the plankothrix blooms last a are, are greater, a longer duration. They're near shore environments. They produce uh, no surface scum. The bloom is less green. However, it's just as toxic. And they tend to persist in low uh, nitrogen waters and they're low light adapted. And so, uh, we've taken a lot of work to, uh, along with Rainer Kermeyer, to uh, clean up our planktothrix from, from our study site in Sandusky Bay. And we have uh, 10 isolates that are currently in culture. Uh, uh, three are non-toxic, seven are toxic, and uh, they produce a suite of uh, uh, demethylated toxins, which is typical for the genus. And uh, they're all in, in so-called uh, uh, Kermeyer's, using Kermeyer's language, uh, all in lineage one, and they're closely related to strains of which are found in Europe. 
So why is Plankton successful in Sandusky Bay? We have known for many years that Plankton Fricks is well adapted to sediment laden uh, water, so they're well, good, well adapted to low light conditions. They also have a broader temperature range. And that uh, microcystis really hits a sweet spot about 27 degrees Celsius, where Plankton Fricks can start growing uh, about 20 degrees. And this really explains in part why the blooms get started so early in the spring. Sediment laden water, uh, cooler temperatures, and that can establish the, uh, the bloom. However, we have, uh, our hypothesis and our, our data show that nitrogen availability uh, appears to be a major driver in the persistence of the blooms. Uh, Justina Hampel uh, has shown that, uh, it, that uh, Planktonix is very good at um, scavenging nitrogen. The Michaelis constant for ammonia is lower than that for microcystis. And also, in her SIL talk, she showed that uh, 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 Planktothrix is supported by a great deal of ammonium regeneration as summer continues. And so we've been able to show that uh, Planktothrix can tolerate long-term nitrogen depletion through a number of studies. And one thing I want to focus on is that there appears to be luxury uptake when nitrogen is available in, uh, early in the spring. Uh, they produce a nitrogen storage polymer and we've been looking at the regulation of the genes involved in cyanophysin synthesis, this nitrogen storage polymer, and cyanophysin degradation. Our first clue that Planktothrix is well adapted to a low, light, a low uh, nitrogen environment uh, came from a study in a reservoir. We, some work we did with Steve on this reservoir in, uh, in Ohio. I urge you never to go there. It's quite a, quite a bad bloom there. Um, and which uh, we noticed at the peak of the bloom, the, uh, the uh, dissolved inorganic nitrogen, dissolved inorganic phosphorus ratio declined well below uh, that for balanced growth. And uh, this was due to a continuous supply of phosphorus from internal loading uh, and, um, uh, and, uh, and assimilation and denitrification uh, uh, contributing to nitrogen losses. I will remind you the plant thrix do not fix nitrogen. Okay, so our study site is Sandusky Bay, Ohio. Uh, it's about 200 square kilometers, and we have a number of, a number of sites here where we have buoys and, uh, uh, and synoptic sampling and, and buoys uh, are providing real-time data. Collectively, have yielded some models, which hopefully Here we see, after a rainfall, phosphorus coming down the Sandusky River, and we're seeing phosphorus enter the what we call the inner bag, the constriction of bridge here. And uh, one thing is that you can see the phosphorus, according to this model, actually does not reach the open lake. Part of this is due to sage effects, uh, due uh, sage effects which restrict the amount of flow coming out of the bay. And so this suggests that a lot of phosphorus stays within the bay, and there's evidence for a lot of internal loading as a consequence of phosphorus being delivered, winding up into sediments. Now contributing to uh, nitrogen losses are high rates of denitrification. There's a cartoon of there's a cartoon of nitrate levels in, uh, in the bay. Uh, coincident with high rates of denitrification, and the rates are about tenfold higher than the seen in Western Lake here. Together, the internal loading of phosphorus uh, plus denitrification uh, can yield uh, N to P ratios of which are quite low. During a drought year where there is very little nutrient input from the river, uh, we're seeing N to P ratios that approach unity. As a consequence of uh, high rates of denitrification uh, during that drought year, uh, we actually saw some uh, an increase in the amount of uh, uh, nitrogen fixing cyanobacteria in the community, looking at the community profiling through it by 16S. And a consequence of the uh, of this, uh, when you when you sample uh, San Sandusky Bay late in the year, uh, this is about 80 micrograms per liter chlorophyll, so bloom conditions. 
you had phosphorus, one sees no effect, but nitrogen in any chemical form or nitrogen concert with phosphorus yields a uh, doubling of the chlorophyll within a 48 hour period. So, phycodrix is stimulated by nitrogen inputs, not phosphorus. Bottom line, phosphorus management will not work for a bloom of this type. Okay, looking at some, at the, some of our uh, metatranscriptomics, we uh, have a number of metatranscriptomes taken through the summer of uh, 2015, where there is a lot of nitrogen coming down the river early in the season, and then that gets denitrified, and the nitrogen is depleted by the beginning of August. Looking at particular genes, and I know Steve says we shouldn't be cherry picking our metatranscriptomes, but I will uh, right now. Uh, I apologize. Uh, CPHA1 is the main gene encoding the cyanophysin synthetase, which is the uh, synthesizer, the main storage polymer for nitrogen. So that's being actively synth that's being this, these genes are actively transcribed until such time as nitrogen becomes depleted. And then CPHB, which is the ficus of the uh, cyanophysin ace, which then recruits the nitrogen from the polymer, this then becomes active. And so uh, this is evidence, transcriptional evidence for the large reuptake mechanism. If we look at nitrogen acquisition from the entire community, uh, we also see that um, the ammonium transporters are, are uh, detectable, trans transcripts are detectable throughout the year, which is consistent with what Justine has seen with ammonium regeneration within the community. Secondly, we also see the minor population of nitrogen fixing cyanobacteria activating their genes as nitrogen becomes depleted. We do see transcription prior to uh, to nitrogen becoming highly depleted, we see it at sort of the onset of depletion. If we, if we bin all our transcripts, uh, we see rather than, we thought there would be some contribution from heterotrophic bacteria providing uh, nitrogen fixation. Uh, however, all the transcripts could be pinned to uh, ephanosomenon or adultosperm. Now looking at nitrogen fixation activity, we, that parallels the transcriptional data that we see nitrogen fixation uh, actually becoming highly active before the depletion of nitrate, uh, detectable nitrate in the system. Uh, all the phosphorus genes are, we can detect are being transcribed throughout the, throughout the season. There's not much to say here. Okay, one thing we, that's just kind of fallen out of this study recently is that uh, we're trying to identify some loss mechanisms uh, for planktophoric blooms. And uh, we're able to detect the, a major lytic phage, which has been uh, actually documented worldwide, uh, PABLD transcripts uh, throughout, the, throughout the summer. Additionally, there's a specific chytrid, which is known to infect, um, uh, known to infect uh, planktothrix. We can detect that as well. And with respect to the viral activity, this, uh, Steve mentioned this just a, a few minutes ago, but it's certainly Viral lysis contributed to the toxicity of the, of the uh, Toledo bloom. We are certainly looking at lytic phages as a potential source of, uh, of, uh, of toxin as well. And so in light of that, we've identified at least uh, two uh, lytic phages based on sequences of the major capsid protein. There's one that's very similar to the original uh, PABLD gene uh, that has the very similar to the original PABLD gene. As another variant with many more nucleotide changes. We think these, uh, these probably don't represent the, the, all the viruses. There are, I'm sure there are more, but we now have them in culture and we can show that we can lice our different strains, our different extenic strains. Uh, and so now we're working with these and trying to figure out the conditions under which we see maximum lysis. Um, additionally, we have the chytrid in culture, and there should be arrows on here, and they're not. But uh, we're trying to understand conditions in which uh, the chytrid we brought into culture yields maximum infection. Oh, there's a sporangium over there, sporangium over here. Okay, so we have two different strains. Whether they produce microcystin or not, uh, they're both, in, uh, they're both uh, uh, susceptible to uh, chytrid infection. Uh, we're trying to figure out conditions which may maximize chytrid infection and, uh, and perhaps uh, promote uh, uh, 
loss of the form, the decline of the form. Okay, come back to this. Uh, we know a little bit more about how the balloon behaves. We think nitrogen, these, these guys can, can, uh, can, can persist in a nitrogen limited environment a lot better than can other cyanobacteria, and that's a reason for its persistence. Now, what, how does that land any sort of management decision? Basically, I don't know. Um, people talk about managing phosphorus to control a microcystis bloom. It clearly will not work for a plant to uh, One thing that people are talking about, we also know from our metatransgromic information that uh, all the genes involved in light stress are highly active. So, and we also know by, uh, by physiological measurements that the uh, that their very that surface irradiances are photoinhibitory. So uh, their environmental engineers are trying to perhaps manage sediment to improve water clarity as a management strategy. But I think that's a very very ambitious goal. But in general, we have blooms. The plankodricks are a longer duration, uh, appear to survive and persist in, it in this low nitrogen environment, and uh, one of their mechanisms is using cyanophycin uh, as a storage molecule during periods of, of uh, nitrogen replete conditions. So with that, I thank you for your attention, and I'll address uh, the question. Phosphate within the cell uh, as there are conditions where we have very high phosphorus concentration in the environment. A cell taking uh, phosphate, dissolved phosphorus inside, and accumulating organic piece of polyphosphate, they can use it then during the low acidity conditions. And uh, once the cells are dying, the polypi can get recycled. And this is actually what we all uh, is well documented and well studied. What we not really uh, fully understand is the accumulation of poly P under low SLP condition, under stress conditions, so called uh, deficiency response. Uh, 
However, quite recently, really quite recently, uh, these all unknown uh, processes, they trigger a lot of studies in marine science. And what we know now for sure, that actually quality is a significant fraction of the total P uh, in ocean, also under pair repeat conditions. Uh, the studies came to some contradictory results, which is why we're getting excited about that. And uh, besides recently, we don't have so many data on quality, uh, on fate of quality, so the understanding is really limited. And that all actually are uh, uh, what we can see here, the controversy. The pioneer study from uh, Martin et al. 2014 was settled in two different uh, phosphorus uh, concentration environments. One is very high and the other is low. And what they found was actually completely opposite what we would expect. You can see here on the high SRP there is polypy and on the low SRP is very high polypy. That is not what we are expecting. And um, they call it deficiency response. It was great, but two years later, uh, in uh, North Pacific, the other data came out, which is completely contradictory. It's not exactly what was found before. And what is even more interesting for us is if you look into the depth profile of poly P ratio to total particle P, or more or less recycling of poly P through the water column. But we can see here, under low SRP condition, there is preferential recycle. <coughs> there is no recycle at all at high uh, P condition. And again, uh, this um, year, a new paper, in tropical Indian Ocean, which is actually not P limited, we found that uh, there is again preferential depletion. So that all was actually trigger my interest to look into that in a uh, freshwater system. And of course, some, somehow intuitively, we know that most likely polypy is important in freshwater. But there is no systematic study on the fate and cycle, especially in water column. Uh, for example, what is the mechanism? Is it luxury uptake? Is it deficiency? And if we really believe that quality is reacting on P concentration, what will be seasonal variability? And if it's, there is a seasonal variability, uh, now, it's suppose there is no actually connection to the community, but if there is some connection to community, is someone working there preferential to take quality? With all that, uh, we went of course to their, our more or less home base on Lake Ontario, and um, I would like to thank the organizer to build this bridge so that we can talk about this here. And what we did there, we cleaned sampling, and where is uh, Martin? Is he still here? From his talk, we know at least the temperature should be okay. So the temperature uh, in weekly sample uh, is reliable. We did two sites, collected multiple um, depths of the water, and uh, sampled total particulate, phosphorus, SRP, uh, polypy, chlorophyll, actually with it, uh, DNA uh, um, extraction, and we also did some uh, lab experiments with different strains of Picosea and bacteria. Okay, talking about the seasonal variability. Here on this slide, you see our data from July till December. On the first panel, it's the temperature and chlorophyll, pretty reasonable going from the high to the, to the low during the winter. Uh, 
soluble reactive phosphorus SRP is very low in summer and then uh, during the turnover is getting higher. And if we look now on the poly P here in red and the total particular P, they are more or less repeating chlorophyll. It's kind of really interesting. But once we normalize the poly P to the total or particular P or to chlorophyll, it's actually getting very interesting. So what we can see here, we have more or less binormal distribution. We have a really high ratio in August, and we're also having high ratio in winter, which is actually very interesting. So we have this peak, uh, which is indicative for the luxury uptake. But what is more interesting, we have this peak, which is actually more typical for the oligotropic ocean. So we have low SRP, still a lot of polypene. And uh, if we look now in the VEX profile, and here again we're on the deeper side, we're looking into the oxygen uh, top uh, temperature. It's nice stratified with the chemocline around 10 meters. And we'll look on chlorophyll, total particular phosphorus to poly P, and the ratio of poly P to total particular P. So what we see now. That is actually a poly P it's getting nice recycled. So the poly P, if we normalize it to the, to the surface, we have around 90% of poly P, which is coming from the surface, is actually get recycled and stay in the water column. So moving our forward, and look into the whole picture, we actually plotted all SRP to the all poly P to total uh, P ratios in uh, this plot. And you can see here, we actually have this phenomenal distribution. We have a deficiency response as well as a luxury uptake. And this is what people in the North Pacific tropical here is actually observing. So it's kind of uh, coming to the to this pattern in, in the boss system, which is very interesting. And uh, the last question, remember, I was asking at the beginning, is there is someone there who has actually preferentially take that? And for this specific study, we did size distribution. We have our filter, 0.2 and filter 2 micrometer. So we actually measured poly P in two different sizes there when we were talking about our poly P accumulation under this extreme condition. And actually, it's um, a special for efficiency response is more important than the larger cell. And um, that's we could support with our lab uh, study. So it's a little bit busy slide. Uh, but in the lab, we are at, investigated three different um, ecoplankton species. And investigating these different species, we we're looking into the cell density, uh, into the SRP. We measured all different parameters, but for now, it's important that once we're looking into the conditions with the higher SRP here at the beginning, we actually have very high uh, ratio poly P in cells, and also moving uh, to the depletion of SRP here, we still have a lot of poly P in the cells. So what does it tell us? It tells us that actually accumulation of poly P is happening in all stage of uh, cell growth through all, all the uh, time slot. And <coughs> variability with the different strains, the variability very high between all the strains. We have all the different uh, poly P cell ratio for three different um, 
because three different people say I'm going to do this else. So that what we conclude from there that, that this dynamic ratio poly P to total particular uh, P uh, is likely due to both to physiological response and also shifting in community. And uh, with this, I would like to uh, summarize our findings, saying that first of all, polyphosphate contributes significantly uh, to the total particulate phosphorus in the eutrophic Bay of Hamilton Harbor, up to 50%. Polyphosphate is preferentially recycled through the water column and it varies significantly between near shore and offshore side. And polyphosphate level is also strongly dynamic uh, in, um, in the Hamilton Harbor and is actually reacting to the phosphorus uh, level very sensitively. And uh, accumulation in picoplankton uh, contributes significantly to the whole poly P in was under the high P conditions, but also under the uh, low concentration of P. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention, and we'll be happy for question comments. We have time. I can start to ask one question. When you say that, um, so you compare the picoplankton and larger cells in terms of uh, use of this composting. Um, when you show the slides where you take this fractionation with natural uh, feed sample, I assume, uh, you know what are the larger cells? Are they, for example, over big channel bacteria or uh, is it just the carriers? We uh, have all this DNA sequencing when processing them. There is actually a mixture. We have, from time to time, we have a blooming period, we have some dominance of different. But actually, I have the data, it's, uh, we know what are there, but it's a mixture. Yes, please. Thank you. Uh, Linda Sickle Gold and Eugene Stormer years ago back in the 80s looked at polyphosphate in Great Lakes Dipons and they also did some heat acts so they showed that there's a lot of trace metals associated with that. And I'm wondering, um, there's also another set of literature looking at polyphosphate and detoxification mechanisms. In Hamilton Harbor, which is quite contaminated, could polyphosphate be playing a role with, say, metal metabolism? That's actually, that was one of my motivation because I'm normally sediment water interaction person. And uh, we did TAM, I did TAM myself. I didn't see any metals there, unfortunately. It's so, like a pure uh, poly P in the culture we have. We didn't do TAM on the samples from uh, Hamilton Harbor. So, but that is actually what can happen. I'm also looking on calcium, uh, Poly P is very reactive, so uh, also the question what will happen on the segment. But this is, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, one very, very rapid question again. Do you know one? why? Thank you for your talk. Do you know why people can, can have this preference for polyphosphate over SRPs? Over other phosphorus cones, so why they accumulate? Uh, the theory is that uh, polyphosphate is a storage, and what I don't know and what I would like to know why they are accumulating under low P conditions. So the, the normally the theory is they're accumulating poly P is reactive and it's very energetic. The binding is very energetic. So it's very effective to use it as the energy for metabolism. So that will be the general answer. You also showed that they are actually you accumulating polyphosphate when there are other other forms available as well. So yeah, that's so called luxury uptake. Yeah. 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 Kind of preference. Mm -hmm.
Okay, we have to move on. Thank you. So next speaker, sorry, Aurélia Jabrio. change a little bit of biological scale in moving from a more large biological scale and, and try to talk about the role of biotic interactions in patterning genetic items assemblages. So first, as we saw in the first talk of this afternoon, and uh, most of you are maybe more aware about uh, than me that uh, lakes are very complex ecosystem. There is a lot of species in these lakes group of species, and uh, these species are diversity patterns which are mainly explained by environmental factors, such as stichochemicals or hydromorphological factors, and they are just used for bioindication. There is also a lot of studies which investigate the role uh, in the biotic relationship between uh, different groups, but they are rarely considered for explaining species assemblages. So the objectives of these studies are uh, is to identify the biotic factors which are influencing the diversity patterns of epiphytic titans communities. And we will uh, more precisely uh, uh, focus on three points. The first is the importance of macrophyte species as a substrate effect because yeah, there is a, a small debate about uh, the, the, the neutral effect of uh, macrophyte or if it's non-neutral. Uh, another point about uh, the interaction with uh, phytoplankton communities, with uh, focus on competition and facilitation. And another point about um, the influence of predation by microbiofauna. So, this is our study area, uh, which is uh, located so in southwestern France, uh, on the Lacano Lake. So, it's uh, maybe a ridiculous uh, small lake for. Uh, uh, the lake we speak before, but for France it's quite a big lake. So it's a shallow lake which had, uh, which had a maximum depth of 8 meters. And uh, on this lake we focus on six stations, uh, shore stations, which are uh, spread uh, all over the, the, the coast. And we surveyed this, this station uh, during one year, in spring, summer, autumn and winter. And uh, we also take some physical chemical measures, so we take three samples in each station. We also measure uh, phytoplankton composition in each of the stations and uh, measure phytoplankton biomass in 12 uh, samples for each station. To sample the epiphytic diatoms communities, we uh, focus on five macrophyte species, which uh, represents different groups of macrophyte species. So Phragmites australis first, which is a nelophyte species, Cara fragifera, which is an algae one, Lobelia dartmana, which is uh, yes, an isolated, which is a uh, protected and uh, round species, Lagarosi for major, which is an invasive species in Australia area, and Junkus bulbosus, which is um, a neutrophile species. On each of these species, we uh, sampled uh, three individuals on different parts of individual, depending on the macrophyte species. And we put this sample in, uh, in water uh, for all of this. And then we make, uh, we shake this, um, this, uh, this water sample in order to, in order to detach diatoms communities. Uh, then we use an integrated sample for uh, diatom identification and macromyofauna identification, and all the other sample for chlorophyll A measures, as well as organic matters measures, in order to compute the ratio uh, between heterotrophic and autotrophic uh, um, organisms. We also uh, yes measure the surface area that we sample on each macrophyte species. So first, the first results, uh, how does the epiphytic diatoms vary with seasons? First, if you look at, look at the biomass, this is chlorophyll A concentration, we observed so a summer peak of uh, biomass, which is quite logical, which is 
it has correlated positively with pH and temperature sensitivity. But if we uh, look at the species richness and uh, diatom species richness that we estimated from uh, 100 square centimeters of uh, macrophage substrates, we observe a completely different patterns with a peak of species richness which was observed in autumn season and the lowest species richness in spring. And the species richness was correlated with more with nitrient, nutrient uh, uh, parameters. Now for the first question we asked was the role of macrophage substrate on these uh, diatoms uh, assemblages. If we have a look to biomass again of chlorophyll A, we observe that the highest um, biomass was observed on La Garosifon Major. So that was the invasive species, which has, which is also the macrophage species, which have the more complex structural uh, form here. Yeah. And the, lower, the lowest biomass on the uh, isolated species, which is Robelia dotman. Yeah. <coughs> so it is also, we have also the highest numbers of individuals on this. But if we look at the species richness now, we again observe a completely different pattern with the highest uh, estimated species richness for Lobelia dotmana, and the lowest one was observed for Lagarus Major. So that suggests an important role of macrophage substrates for uh, dietary communities. Now, the interaction with phytoplankton. Uh, if we plot the epiphytic total biomass against the phytoplankton total biomass, we observe almost no significant relationship, except maybe for autumn when we observe a very small uh, trend that suggests that there is almost no competition maybe between uh, these two uh, communities at the scale that uh, we analyze. And if we look more precisely to the species identity and if we compare the, common, the percentage of common species between the two communities, so the epiphyt diatoms communities and the phytoplankton ones, globally we found that about 12% of uh, biotic species were found in the phytoplankton communities. And among this uh, 12% we observe uh, the highest numbers of common species in, again, Lagarosifo Major, so the species which has the highest structural complexity, so maybe that this species is able to catch uh, some uh, phytoplankton species from the water column, and the lowest one from Lobelia, Lobelia Dotmana, which, uh, yes, is, uh, is more a rosette species, yes. So now the influence of Relation of uh, microbiofauna. So first, just how those we quantify the heterotrophic biomass. We plot uh, the chlorophyll A concentration against organic matter content, and so we have a significant relationship between them. And we use the residuals. So positive residuals mean that we have probably more heterotroph species than autotroph species, whereas negative residuals mean that we have excess maybe of autotroph species. So we use these residuals as a measure of uh, heterotrophic codification of heterotrophic. If we plot so these residuals with seasons, uh, so the zero is there, we observe that we have more autotroph species in spring and more autotroph species in, uh, in autumn. Yes, and uh, so with an increase in the peak in autumn. And this that really looks like the first plot I saw you about species richness of diatom species, which have yes, the same pattern. So if we plot now the estimated species richness against uh, the residual the heterotrophic quantification, we have a significant linear relationship, positive, suggesting that more you have predators, maybe more you have uh, species richness in your communities. So to conclude now, we uh, observe so different patterns of between species richness and uh, biomass in epiphytic diatoms communities, which, which has suggest that there is different processes which structure biomass and species richness. It's uh, going uh, against the more individual hypothesis, which states that more you have biomass, more you have individuals, and more you have species. But it's uh, it's a hypothesis which is largely debated, and you can see uh, the recent papers talked about that. Uh, we found also that macrophyte was a non-neutral substrate and, and uh, uh, with uh, probably a big effect of the structures, the, the, the physical structures of macrophyte with a more complex 
structures able to absorb more individuals, more bio biomass, and also able to catch more species from the phytoplankton communities. And an interesting result was we found that um, more species were, were found on isolated species, which are so species with uh, high um, diversity value, biodiversity value, and uh, they also seem to have a high functional value uh, for that because they also uh, have more diverse species for that. We found that predation enhanced species richness, probably in limiting competitive exclusion, but was an old result for ecological studies, but I think it's I've never been uh, shown before on this uh, type of communities. And finally, we found few evidence of uh, competition between phytoplankton and uh, uh, epiphytic diatoms community, but more sort of facilitation process with uh, flux and ex exchange of spaces between um, phytoplankton and epiphytic diatoms communities. So that's all. Thank you very much for your attention. <coughs> Thank you, Elena. We have plenty of time for questions. Okay, let's start again. So, uh, looking at your sampling strategy, I just want to understand where. Um, I noticed that you use just one specimen for your diatom inventory, right? Or no, three one. Three, three oh. specimens for <laughs> macrophage specimens. For the diatom also? For the epiphytes? Ah, for the epiphytes, yes. For uh, just one? It's an integrated sample for two individuals. Okay, okay. And it's all over the length of your six uh, yes, samples, six and samples. you are doing all the seeding, right? Yes. Okay. So, and do you think that you have, thanks to that kind of strategy, a good idea of, let's say, something which is representative of all the ecosystems about this uh, epiphyte and diatom assemblages? Um, well, uh, the species we take was. Uh, for most of them, the most abundant species from the test of studies in Carafage, if you are because this was represents the most of the macrophage biomass. So, yeah, in this sense, yes, but we didn't sample also uh, all the um, diatom community that could be present on the walls and on the other side. Maybe we missed this, this type of communities, yes. Different than effect across macrophytes and, and uh, this uh, greater uh, macrophyte that have most complexity. Did you consider standardizing for the surface area? Or was that something? It was standardized for the surface area. Yes, we we, we uh, I think I just uh, yes we, we we construct a species accumulation curve with randomization for that and we estimated species richness for uh, 100 square centimeters. So yes. Uh, yes, because for each macrophyte species, we make species accumulation curve uh, with random. Or yes, we use 999 uh, random samples to construct this species curve and estimate it from this curve the species richness. Twice this estimated species richness. Yes. Yes. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. 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 Good afternoon, everybody. This is uh, what I promised to talk about. The effect of these differentiation and fitness differences allow the coexistence of small and large phytoplankton in large lakes, or well, admittedly small and large lakes. The reason I put the Darwin finches here, because it's such a classical example of how, from a homogeneous beginning, the ancestor through adaptive radiation, a whole different set of sizes of beaks evolved. And because the species now have different beak sizes, they minimize competition for limiting resources and that allows them to, to coexist. So I'll, I'll look at this same sort of aspect for phytoplankton, the effect of size in phytoplankton and coexistence. But in the modern perspective, we have to add fitness differences to niche differences. So, Steve just said we have to honor the classic papers um, in, in ecology. 
and for me few papers are as classic as the paradox of the plankton, which asks the famous question, how is that we have so many different species of phytoplankton that coexist in the lake, because according to the principle of competitive exclusion, they should compete and exclude each other. And over the years, there's many, many solutions to the paradox of the plankton, and here is one of them. There's two different ways to coexist. You can be different enough, that's the niche-based view, or you can be similar enough, that's the neutral view. So in the niche-based view, species are different, fitness differences are large. For fitness, if we talk about microbes like phytoplankton, it's somewhat easier to think about simply in, in terms of growth rate. So high fitness, fast growth. Niches allow coexistence of different species. So niches act as stabilizing factors that allow species to coexist if they are different enough. Community assembly in the niche-based view is driven by species interactions and interactions with the abiotic environment. Then on the other hand, there's Hubble's neutral view. Species are really interchangeable. There are no niche differences. Fitness differences are small, that's the reason you can coexist. Coexistence patterns are random, and community assembly in this case is driven by dispersal and stochasticity. And of course, in reality, I think the two of them interact to allow species coexistence and biodiversity. So here's the modern perspective on coexistence. We have to look at both niche differences, the stabilizing factors, and fitness differences, the equalizing factors, together to explain <coughs> coexistence. In this presentation, we have an experimental approach, and I have to mention my two collaborators <coughs> on this work, Irene Gallego and Patrick Venay. And if you're interested, the work is currently accepted for pu publication in ISMA journal. So here's the modern perspective that was developed by Peter Chesson. And if you look at this graph here, on the x-axis we have niche difference, on the y-axis we have relative fitness differences, and there's two different parts. So if, if niche differences are high and relative fitness differences are low, it's easy to coexist because you would be up here in this region where niche differences act to stabilize your coexistence and fitness differences are, are small. If niche differences are low and fitness differences are high, you're up here, then there's nothing to stop you from going towards competitive exclusion. And then neutrality is a special case where both of them, both niche differences and fitness differences are both small. So that's the theoretical pr uh, framework. And in the title, I promise to look at the effect of size, size difference rather, in phytoplankton on coexistence. And for that reason, I show this, this graph from a paper by Alan Litzman and, and Christoph Klausmeyer, where really you can see that in phytoplankton, cell size is the master trait that affects all key processes like reproduction, uptake of resources, and predator avoidance. So really size is a master trait in phytoplankton. When you, do, when you think about coexistence and the effect of size and coexistence, there's people that work on plants, and there's a few people that work on plankton, and true, so the, the, the size range you can cover in both is, is orders of magnitude, whether you work on phytoplankton going from pico to colonial, or you work on the smallest mosses to giant sequoias, the size difference is the same. However, I've not found a way to put mosses and sequoias in one experimental chamber, and we chose to work with phytoplankton. So here's what we did. We have six species of cyanobacteria. We do invasion from rare experiments. So we take 5% of an invader and we inoculate it into 95% into of a resident population. We have 15 unique pairs and 30 unique invasion experiments. If you look at the, of, of some of the first results, so on the x-axis all the time we have uh, delta size, the difference in size between the two competitors in the pair, so the invader and the resident one. You can see that as size difference goes up, niche difference goes up, meaning that niches stabilize the coexistence of small and large cyanobacteria because the niches are different enough. 
the, the second plot shows that the second plot shows that also relative fitness difference goes up when size difference increases. So this would actually then have the opposite effect that if your fitness differences increase, then competitive exclusion becomes more likely. The fact that there's one process that goes up with size difference that stabilizes coexistence and one that would lead to competitive exclusion means that the combined effect makes it very hard to predict what the effect of size difference on coexistence is, as shown in, in, the, in the third plot. So here's some of the calculations. I don't need you to go into detail. Just be aware that we use something called sensitivity. Basically, sensitivity is the growth rate of the cyanobacterium when it grows alone compared to its growth rate when it has to compete with an invader. So if you have low sensitivity, basically you don't care about the invasion, you will do almost as well, just as well in presence of competitor as when you're alone. If you have high sensitivity, you'll badly affected by the invasion. So from the sensitivity, you can calculate the niche differences, the relative fitness differences, and basically from those two, the balance between niche and fitness differences, you can calculate whether competitive exclusion or coexistence would occur. So here are some of the results. So again, niche differences on the x-axis, relative fitness difference on the y-axis, and like in the theoretical plot from CISO, here we have the two different parts of the graph, we have stable coexistence because niche differences are large enough to allow fitness differences to compensate for fitness differences and here we have a part where there's competitive exclusion. What you see certain pairs, like the pair high up here, which is synthesis and Afnocapsa, there's a large size difference between the two of them. Afnocapsa is ten times larger than synthesis. They can coexist despite, you know, despite a very high relative fitness difference. You know, one is small, the other is large, so the smaller one probably grows much faster. Despite the high fitness difference, there's a large fitness difference too, and this fitness difference compensates for fitness, so they coexist. The opposite is, is, is possible too. There are pairs here where, despite, you know, some, some niche difference, it's not enough to compensate for fitness differences and just competitive exclusion. What I, want to, what I would like to point out from this graph is that two-thirds of all pairs actually allow coexistence. So coexistence in, in the invasion experiments was much more common than competitive exclusion. The other thing, any pair where there's two orders of magnitude difference in size always coexisted. So you can see the different size of the symbols indicate the difference in size, so large symbols Light size difference, always coexistence. In this plot, we look at this sensitivity that I that I introduced. Basically, in this plot, there's two two types of cyanobacterial behavior. There's those that are loners, cyanobacteria that say, "I'm fine on my own, but I really don't want any company." They are the triangles, and then those that really. Yeah, they're fine on their own, but they're also, they don't mind having company, so they're good company. It's a pairwise comparison again, because it's pairwise experiments, so anytime you need to compare those that are above each other, so for instance, this one compared with this one, this one compared with that one. There's three areas in the plot. At the top, we have very high sensitivity, basically species that are so sensitive to compare that they can never invade. Then there are species with high sensitivity that can invade, but only just. And then down here are the really good company, those that say, I find it very easy to invade you. I don't really care that you're there. There's several messages in this plot, but I want to point out here is that in the pair, almost always the larger one of the two was the more sensitive one. So, with two exceptions, the filled symbols are the ones where the larger one was less, less sensitive, otherwise always smaller species are less sensitive to, to competition than larger ones. I'm sorry for the quality of this, this, this slide, so you can't read it in the back, I'm sure. What we do here is structural equation modeling. So in structural equation modeling, you have 
an endogenous variable of interest, Z in this case, that is affected by an exogenous variable X, either directly or via mediators. So in this case, our endogenous variable is coexistence, that's what we're interested in. Delta size in this plot is the exogenous variable, so we can look either, that's the outer lane, look for direct effects of size and coexistence, or we can look via the mediating effects of niche difference and relative fitness difference in coexistence. So, doing the models and looking at the p-values, what I can say, although you can't read it, that there is a highly significant effect of size difference, delta size on niche difference. We've seen that. If the niche difference, if the size difference increases, these differences go up, allow it to stay the coexistence. And as we've seen, there's also a significant effect of delta size and relative fitness difference. Going from niche difference to coexistence, there's a highly significant effect there. So we know that niches stabilize coexistence, and we find this in this experiment too. There's no significant effect of relative fitness difference. Also, there's no direct effect of delta size and coexistence. It's mediated via niches and relative fitness differences. So size positively affects niche and fitness difference. Prevalence of coexistence is positively related to niche differences. Species are more likely to coexist as niche differences increase. And size difference does not directly link to coexistence. Then we also did another SEM. In this case, it's not size difference. It's the phylogenetic distance that is on the, as the exogenous variable. So the question is, does evolutionary relatedness capture phenotypic differences in our case, size difference? Basically, it doesn't. Phylogenetic distance is not informative in our experiments in explaining either niche differences, fitness differences, or coexistence. So this is a bit worrying when we think that the evolutionary relatedness of the same bacteria that we work with has no effect on understanding their ecology. And we're not the first ones actually to point this out in phytoplankton experiments. So here's the, the conclusion from my work. Our work, I hope I can remember what I've drawn here. Um, what it says basically is that niche differences trump relative fitness differences in predicting coexistence of phytoplankton in size-based invasion experiments. <laughs> and I don't even have one minute to read out the take-home messages. I do, they're very kind here. The differences in size among species positively influence both niche and fitness differences, but cannot predict coexistence. Smaller species were generally less sensitive meaning they did well in the presence of a competitor, less sensitive than larger species. Yet this did not necessarily lead to competitive exclusion, since despite the fitness difference, the fitness advantage that the small species have, there's also these differences that stabilize coexistence of small and large. Species coexistence is more directly determined by these dissimilarities than relative fitness differences. And our findings suggest that size is more than a key trait controlling physiological and population level aspects of phytoplankton, it appears to be relevant to explain community level phenomena such as niche differences, fitness differences, leading to coexistence and biodiversity. Finally, the paradox, the paradox of the plankton. I think by now, much as I regret it, I have to agree with David Tillman that it's time to bury the paradox of the plankton. Coexistence seems to be the rule and competitive exclusion seems to be the exception. So with that, uh, <coughs> thank you. Thank you, guys. Question for Stephen? Um, yeah. We need to debate that variant, first of all, over a year, because that might take you a, a challenge there. Which one? Uh, the last thing will carry the turn off the plank. Okay. There's some things missing in that. Okay. But if you have an organism that can form a colony or a filament, yeah. do you treat it as big or small? Yeah. Um, the question is whether, if, if you think about size, what is the unit size we care about in phytoplankton? It's, I mean, I have to say, in the experiment, for that reason, we, we, we did not want to have a confounding effect of shape. So the role, 
a spherical shape assembly table that, that, we, that we put in the experiment. It's true that shape, like size, has a very important effect. So filamentous assembly material clearly are different than colonial assembly material. Um, again, in the experiment, we took the unit size, so it's not the cell of the size. We had single cells, we had colonial ones. So the colonial ones were the bigger ones in the experiments, but we say ecologically it's the colonial, the colonial unit that matters and not so much the cell of the unit. Another question? Well, that's in your model, and when we talk about this uh, coexistence and paradox of the plankton, we uh, make the, uh, the deal is that we use Peter Plankton species. But can we imagine to have the same kind of uh, can we imagine to make this work with bacteria and phytoplankton? Well, I mean, you can imagine it, yes. In terms of competition and so on? Yeah. Clearly, there would be some, some complicating factors, like the energy source would be different, the carbon source become, becomes more important to control in your experiments. But it's true that in, in a lake, you know, they both need bacteria, heterotrophic bacteria and phototrophic bacteria. They all need things like phosphorus, so they are competing for it. And they, they need, in the end, you know, if there's only so much resource, it, it's possible that it may lead to, to exclusion of phytoplankton because the phosphorus is going to the bacteria. So yes, the bigger picture does make sense to, yeah, to think about it. is too insane. Another question? Yes? <laughs> Thank you, Bart. It was an exciting talk. I'm just wondering, you were talking about the competition. What is about the predators? What is about top-down? Well, I mean, clearly they were not part of the experiments, much as I would like to do, you know, for instance, introduce a chytrids in experiments like this. And, we do experiments with sanitary and chytrids too, um, but so far we haven't managed to combine the two. In, in, in nature, clearly a niche is a multidimensional concept, so yes, in nature, other than the mechanisms I've, I've talked about here, there's much more scope for coexistence. Um, that, that comes, from, for instance, from com complexity like bringing in the predators um, or the parasites into the picture. So adding even more to the idea that coexistence in reality in the plankton is not so different. It's not so difficult. back to uh, ecosystem. So let me introduce you the case uh, of Lake Boje, which is the largest natural lake in France. So just to give you a few characteristics, its maximum length is about 18 kilometers, so phase 42 square meter, total volume of about 3.6 cubic kilometers, max depth 147 meters and so on. So this lake it's interesting because it has been surveyed for a few decades now, and thanks to uh, both your classical immunological survey and paleoimmunology, we know now that sequencing was a good oligotrophic before the 40s, with typical total phosphorus concentration, concentration below 10 microgram per liter. And uh, after this period, like many other ecosystems uh, in Europe, but also elsewhere, it underground, uh, underwent eutrophication and uh, reached uh, phosphorus concentration higher than 100 microgram per liter uh, at the end of the 70s, early 80s. So, um, the makers decided to restore this ecosystem, and um, it has been a really beautiful success of rehabilitation, of restoration, because um, after 2000, phosphorus was reduced below 24, 25 microgram per liter, and uh, if we just look at these different proxies, different immunological parameters, uh, we are uh, quite used uh, uh, to like phosphate concentration. You can see indeed that this decrease was dramatic for the phosphorus, 
now we are about 10 microgram per liter. You can see also the decrease of chlorophyll A concentration maximum in summer and the concomitant increase of water trans transparency. So, uh, <coughs> when going back to the phosphorus concentration on the left uh, part of the slide, you can see that uh, during the last 20 years we had this beautiful linear decrease of the phosphorus. But again, like many of the ecosystems, uh, it was not the case for phytoplankton biomass, uh, which still increased during this period, and there was not a concomitant parallel decrease of phytoplankton related to the phosphorus concentration, which is quite well known with the hysteresis process in large lakes. However, what we noticed is that in 2009 there was a dramatic shift, uh, as you can see here in the biomass of the phytoplankton, and this first observation was the beginning of the project I will present you today, that was the work of a master degree student, that work on this data uh, this year, Nina. I will present her uh, in a few slides again after. Um, and it was the, so the, the first idea to, to look at what looked like a regime shift. So, if we talk about ecosystems, we know that uh, they consist of uh, both physical, chemical, and biological uh, compartments and interactions in terms of transfer of matter and energy, and all these ecosystem dynamics and functioning are going to be responsible for the stability, the steady state of the ecosystem and what we call the resilience, which is the ability of the system to return to a prior state after having undergone a disturbance. And uh, we know now that this ecosystem, of course, are subjective to uh, different pressures, human pressures, local and more global. And of course, all this is going to uh, impact the ecosystem dynamics and the stability, the resilience of the systems. So we know that the type of responses of the ecosystem can be summarized like this. You can have a linear uh, response. You can have something more gradual or something that can be more uh, dramatic with kind of shift where ecosystems, uh, parameters or uh, processes can pass from a state to another one. And when we have these two states and this uh, dramatic shift, we call this a uh, critical transition or a regime shift. And the, the point between the two states are, referring, are, are referred to uh, what we call a tipping point, but, but it's this kind of threshold. So, in fact, the aim of this study was to try to look for these nonlinear biological temporal changes um, to be eventually a chronology for such changes, find early warning signals, and search for possible drivers of this change. Clearly, uh, for managers, looking for this tipping point, looking for this Critical changes can be quite uh, interesting uh, to try to prevent deterioration um, of the ecosystem in terms of idea of what can uh, be the future of them. So, to try to um, realize this study, we uh, use the data that we have in our observatory of lakes. We have huge databases. And in the case of Lake Bojan, we have a complete survey now from 2004 to, to now and we used the data between 2004 and 2015. We selected some key immunological variables, temperature, nitrogen, phosphorus, silica, and transparency, and we looked at different biological compartments, phytoplankton, of course, but also zooplankton, fishes, and macrophytes. We used a battery of different statistics and model uh, methods. I will not detail this for an uh, evident question of time, so I invite you to go and see the poster of Nina, who uh, once more led this work and uh, made a uh, poster uh, explaining all the methods we use for uh, this work. So, so going back to the phytoplankton, uh, here is represented the temporal variation of the phytoplankton biomass through the scores of the uh, uh, principal component analysis, and you can see the beautiful shift that you already see uh, saw with the biomass a few slides ago. Uh, and, uh, Thanks to this uh, additive uh, model and uh, what we call the EDF, uh, this is typically what we can refer to a regime shift. And the tipping point for this was uh, could be uh, found uh, at early summer uh, 2009. So um, looking at this, we tried to go further. And what was interesting is that we tried to look at the different species that were a characteristic of this assemblage. And what you can see here is just a selection of, of a few species. Uh, but to add exactly the same kind of regime shift, uh, it was typically the case for plantatrix rubescence, but also 
uh, show a huge decline after 2009, that it was also the case for novel filamentous species, Mugiosia, while at the same time, other species, more uh, symbolizing uh, oligotrophic conditions, uh, increased as uh, represented by these uh, two of forms on the right side. We could also remove also different other proxies, for example, the proportion of the colonies or the filaments, and we saw again this shift around 2009, or again looking at different proxies like the percentage of uh, mixotrophs or strict autotrophs and look again that looking to these different uh, morphological or functional traits will also the same kind of response. What was true uh, at the community level and looking at different species, I will talk about again in a few slides, we also look at niche occupation and this is typically the dynamics and distribution of plantatrix rubescence uh, between 2004 and 2015. And what you can see for this FICO eritrean rich species, uh, you see the biomass between 2004 and 2009, this form was blooming in Lake Boje, and after 2009, completely disappeared. And that at the same time, what was really interesting is that all FICO eritrean rich species, uh, represented here by cryptophytes and pictocyanobacteria, um, increase in biomass and also uh, develop deeper in the water column and occupy a niche that became vacant uh, after the reduction of the decline of plantatrix rubescence. As I told you, we look at the different species for both phytoplankton and also zooplankton, and in fact, we found that almost 20 species responded to this region shift, and you can see the different dynamics of this. Uh, once more, this is the scores of the CP for the different species. And what was really interesting is that we could uh, observe that many of these changes were, in fact, restricted to very short window between 2008 and 2011, which is symbolized here. And uh, what we tried to do, looking at this change, was uh, to try to find a chronology, to try to see if interaction between phyto and zooplankton could explain a part of this uh, change. Uh, Hopefully, uh, it was not the case, but uh, and there was uh, sorry, there was no clear hierarchy between phytoplankton and zooplankton taxa, and we could not really explain um, through interaction between the two compartments these uh, shifts. Um, looking at early warning signals uh, that could be responsible for this shift, uh, when you try to look at this using statistical tools, uh, one of the ways of looking at this is looking at the variance and autocorrelation of the data that we are supposed to increase all together. That was not the case in our situation, so we uh, were obliged to conclude that there was no really um, uh, conclusive results about that and we are not, um, it was not possible to detect these early warning signals. Going to other uh, compartments, uh, what was true for phytoplankton and some zooplankton species was also true for some of the fishes in Lake Roger. And this is typically what you can see here with three uh, specimens, three uh, representatives of the fish community, especially for the white fish. Where you can see that indeed, uh, looking, when we look at the catches from both amateur, professional, or scientific catches, we could observe that indeed there was a dramatic shift around 2009 or so for the white fish where you can see this biomass that really increased for the, well, for the catch of the fish that, were, that really increased. And this was clearly concomitant with the decrease once more with this main species that was responsible for the shift of the phytoplankton that was prone to through this. So, so studies have shown um, on that case that maybe a cyanobacter could in fact impact the white fish through larval development, troubles, physiological stress, so there was probably a link between these two, uh, these two compartments. What was true for the pelagic was also true for the litera, and this was a very interesting result for us, is that most of the time we were looking when we saw this lake uh, at the middle part of the lake, which is responsible, uh, which is characteristic of the lake and of the pelagia, but we also found that looking for macrophytes, that also a very a kind of relationship or a dramatic tradition occurred also in uh, the benching part of the littoral zone of this place because uh, after, uh, before and after 2009, we could observe a significant increase in the maximum colonization depth of the different macrophytes. Normally, the figure is not really true, but uh, the macrophyte, the density of the macrophyte, were on average 
really developed between 5 and 8 meters uh, before 2008, and it was between 12 and 15 meters after 2011. So, clearly what we saw for the body is that this uh, ecosystem underwent eutrophication uh, and a beautiful real eutrophication process from the 80s to, uh, to now. And uh, there was not a clear uh, decrease uh, of the different uh, phytoplankton biomass during that time, and the history was very important as it has been shown for different ecosystems. And we could observe non-linear temperature change, and most of them occurred in a very short time window, uh, both at the ecosystem level, both in the pelagic and in the belting zone. Of course, uh, we are aware of the needs of the study because we were not able to find explanatory variables, and typically uh, what could be the precursor signals of this, but maybe it is due to the restricted choice of the immunological variables and the short time long, a relatively short long time series, and also because it was not really high frequency data. So, as I told you, maybe this was this is one of the reasons why we felt to detect this early one in the signals. So, um, sorry. as a perspective, uh, uh, we will, what we will try to do in the near future is to select more underwater variables to detect these potential drivers. Typically, we uh, have not looked yet to climatic uh, drivers, typically wind, precipitation, irradiance, and so on, but we know that can be really important to uh, be uh, good explanatory variables for these shifts. Uh, we will not be able, of course, to increase the sampling strategy because of the databases, but after we will also use material motion models to have a better inside of these uh, shifts. Thank you for your attention. In the um, <coughs> looking for the shifts, I, li I like to think of these shifts as requiring some sort of a feedback mechanism, and oftentimes we think about, I think, anoxia and hyperemia. But I'm assuming this lake is deep enough that it probably didn't go anoxic. Yeah. Um we don't know exactly uh, what can be exactly uh, the process. Uh, it's, most of the data indeed are related to the 0 to 20 meters depth surface layer. So the impact of what could be from the bottom, yes, it's difficult to... I, I, don't, I have no idea. And, and I, forget if, I forget if you showed it. Did you show any like um, light data in terms of second disk or was there a, 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 a dramatic change in the second disk at that same time? Yeah. Did you find some relationship with the relationship between the phytoplankton and the zooplankton community? No. Shift? No. Okay. No. Because you, you have some change in the community. Yeah, in fact, there was, there was changes in different species of the phytoplankton and the zooplankton responding to what we think to be a regime shift regarding the statistical value and, and models and so on. But uh, when we try to make kind of relationship between the different species or uh, yeah, correlation and so on with interaction between different species there was nothing so so what did you think uh, caused the final collapse of plankton threats the final crash was it was it was it cyanobarge yeah. that we've heard about, or was it... Uh, no, this one, we know, this one we know exactly what happened, so I can make the chronology just here. In fact, uh, for Prototype, it's, it's, it's true that for this time it was more a general um, aspect, but if we just focus on Prototype, on the project, we know quite well what happened in 2009, so this is typically what happened, and uh, I just made a slide to explain this. So this is a comparison between, for example, 2008 and 2009, and you can see the biomass of proto trees here. And uh, 2008 being a uh, year like the others when there was a blooming uh, situation. So what you can see here, that in 2008, like, uh, like the years before, you had an increase of the biomass during the whole year. But in 2009, you can see that the biomass from the end of the summer decreased, uh, declined abruptly, uh, quite to zero. 
So, a little explanation of that is that, uh, first of all, uh, there was, uh, we know that the species, when you look at the description of the species, it is most of the time uh, f uh, localized in, um, at an intermediate depth, around 15, 20 meters in this lake. So it's what you can see uh, for 2008 uh, here, and compared to 2009. But what happened in 2008, like the other years, is that the stability is going to change because of the wind in fall, and this is going to uh, replace all the sea water through the water column, but can reach nutrients uh, in, let's say, um, deeper layers, but also light in upper layers. But in 2009, there was almost no room, and the stability uh, stays exactly the same during all the falls. So in fact, first, first of all, there was kind of limitation in terms of the, the mixing uh, for the species. Of course, when you look at the phosphorus, what was uh, amazing for this year is that uh, in 2008, like the years before, we still had, at the uh, period of time of four, sufficient nutrients in both of total phosphorus or available phosphate uh, in fall. But at the end of 2009, there was no nutrient at all. It was the first time that we see the situation where in October, November, and December, there was no phosphorus available at all. And uh, in addition to that, uh, in 2009, we also observed that there was a uh, uh, very important uh, zooplankton community and um, the study in this lake also showed that, in fact, uh, this yellow bacterium, this yellow bacterium was not a uh, trophic head uh, hen for, this, uh, for, for some of the zooplankton species, and some of them were very important in 2009. And this could also be related to the fact that because the biomass decreased, there was no toxic toxicity anymore, and the length of the filament was reduced. So, in fact, the idea here is just to tell you that it was a conjunction of multi-multi processes and factors that intervened to the decline of this yellow bacterium. And to the end of that, is that uh, looking at the climatic aspects, when we look at uh, the winter and the spring period in 2010, uh, it was a really cold period. And uh, in terms of metabolism, it's not really cool for that kind of species, even if it likes cold water. But uh, what is important is that it means, let's say, hot conditions, relatively hot conditions, um, especially in winter, when it is also necessary to have a inoculum to be responsible to what is going to occur after. And the develop knows nothing. So, the main part of that is that all this thing all together probably was the reason of the defect. So it was not one factor, but a multi-proxy of that. Winter, winter was the final nail in the coffin, was it, for the, yeah. the, the final demise. Thank you. So I, I think we should stop there or overdue for a coffee break. Um, and I think we should come back in 30 minutes. Okay, so half an hour coffee break, we'll start the half coffee break a little bit late. No, I almost stuck out in the end. Oh good, I was thinking what's wrong with me. Okay, good job, Sally. Should we go get a cup of tea coffee? Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, uh, I was thinking to do Get this um, kind of 
you understand the players on the landscape, and the reinforcements can be coming from places that you're not thinking. Especially for some foot clients, because we always just stay in terms of information. And we're missing this whole other conversation out there. Mm -hmm. and, and this forces you and to kind of step back. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and a little, yeah. <laughs> but partly because we're all communicating. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, this stuff is just fascinating to me as I've gotten this advanced, more advanced place in my career. Mm -hmm. And I've felt like oh, I don't see a lot of transparency, as much transparency to policy as I would like to see. Right. Mm -hmm. And the why is that? Happened. And what's, yeah. what's the reflection? You know, mm -hmm. I end up here every time. And partly because of science, like it's drawing models and it's yeah. putting it in this like quantifiable, right. semi quantifiable construct. Mm -hmm. But it also makes sense. And like the second talk here is about Cornell. Yeah. And I got kind of way through that. I finished it now. Um, and then that. Um, and it, it's a way to be deliberate about your approaches instead of reactionary and doing your thing. You know, engaging your brain. Yeah. In your approach. That I can think about. With, I'm just. I'm going to start an adaptive management class this week. Precisely. Yeah. And so you know, I have to start thinking Who about. Who that? Um, it's uh, Mike Jones. Oh. That's you. Oh, you're taking that. I am. Oh, nice. Yeah, I'm really, I'm really familiar I'm with out his because approaches. The webinars are this week. I have Tuesdays and Tuesday and Thursdays. Oh, so Tomorrow, you have to go bug out gosh. and do it at night. Oh. It's at uh, from yeah. three to five um, okay. time. Okay. So nine to eleven, I'll well, be on a webinar. If, my if you're um, confused by the I I've worked with a lot of his models and implementation, and, and yeah, they're really good. Um, I don't even know if Mike's been plugged into this system thinking. I mean, it's definitely related, okay. um, but I don't know how much he's even plugged into some of this literature mm -hmm. because it's mm -hmm. come at me through another environmental leadership program I had done nationally. Okay. Um, it kind of started coming into me there and in conversations with people, then they'd recommend books, mm -hmm. and I have a bunch of books that are really good to read. About well, well, yeah, I'll definitely so, be hitting you up maybe over the uh -huh. course of the next few months. But I love Mike's class. approach. Oh, good. It's very collaborative. Good. And, yeah. Because the whole reason I'm taking it is because I'm helping it. to develop the adaptive yeah. management approach for our like Erie Development Action Plan implementation. Okay. So I have a very, um, yeah, very focused on we want to get He'll something probably going. use a bunch of Lake Michigan examples. Okay. Um, but no, I would like to see his approach grow up, mm -hmm. and you know, because it's been very fishy. Yeah. And um, and then I'd like to see this approach grow in and merge okay. a little good. bit. Would good. be Maybe my we can somehow ideal. consider it for our <laughs> yeah. domestic action yeah. plan stuff yeah. and how we approach mm -hmm. collaboration. Do you, are you familiar with the system? She was stuff. just telling me about it earlier, right? and uh, I'm not, and I'm really happy that you're taking some more adaptive yeah. management stuff, because I'm going to be on that committee, but me too. it's been a while since I looked at any of that stuff. So. No, me Mike too. does some good things. And he was trained out on the West Coast. Yeah, I'll try to share as much material information as I can. And Mike's background comes from the West Coast, in you know, British Columbia and Washington, oh. where they're kind of like the think tanks for this uh, applied, uh, mm -hmm. applied decision. Mm -hmm.
Kim.
Okay, so um, we'd like to get started again. Um, before uh, we start with the session, a lot asked me to make an announcement um, about tomorrow, and that is that um, in the morning tomorrow, uh, there'll be one session first thing in the morning in here, and then after coffee break, our session will continue, uh, and another session will be going on here, and our session will start up again at 11 o'clock in Tempters, up in floor two. Um, so the session four will be the session that is upstairs uh, tomorrow from between 11 to 12.15, and the other session will be in here. So the next speaker is uh, Fabio Lepore, who will talk uh, his title has changed slightly. Uh, his talk on herbivore ecological efficiencies in a freshwater ecologic food chain. Thank you very much. I think we should all be concerned about ecological efficiency because ecological efficiency underpins some of the ecosystem services that we value in lakes, such as clear water and fisheries. It also explains uh, some of the recent um, ecological issues, including, for instance, uh, toxic pollution and uh, nutrient enrichment in lakes. So, what is ecological efficiency? By ecological efficiency, I mean essentially trophic efficiency, which is a concept that was defined back in the 1940s. And that is essentially the amount of energy or the proportion of energy that is transferred from one trophic level to the next across a food chain. And the herbivore ecological efficiency, which is in the title, or herbivore efficiency, just to make it short, is this first of the series of transfers. So it's essentially the transfer of energy between the plants and the herbivores. Now, this is very important because uh, <coughs> herbivore efficiency can constrain the flux of energy all across the food chain, and also it's known to vary quite a lot in space and in time. Now, despite this importance, there isn't a lot of theory concerning the factors that can modify herbivore efficiency in lakes. However, I was able to find some hypotheses and predictions in the literature, and these hypotheses and predictions, predictions concern essentially two factors, nutrients on one hand and predation on the other hand. Now, I was able to find three hypotheses concerning the effects of nutrients on herbivore efficiency. And today, just for this talk, I'm going to focus on just one of them, which is uh, this one here, which is derived from ecological stoichiometry, which predicts that herbivore efficiency should increase with increasing phosphorus concentrations in lakes. And the reason for that is that uh, some of the key grazers in lakes, and especially one, so Daphnia, and particularly the, the, the large species of Daphnia, are known to have high requirements for phosphorus. And phosphorus concentration in lakes is predicted to increase the phosphorus content or the phosphorus to carbon ratio of the food, in this case, phytoplankton. Now, I was only able to find one hypothesis concerning the effects of predators on herbivore efficiency, and this hypothesis is derived essentially from old models of top-down control in food chains, and this is essentially the HSS model from the 1960s. So, according to this model, we have predators in a system. Um, these predators can limit the herbivores below, and therefore, the herbivores cannot expand to the level where they can control the primary producers. And as a result of that, this flux of energy here is quite reduced. However, if you remove the predators, or if the effect of the predators is weakened, then the herbivores can expand, they can start controlling the primary producers from the top down. And based on this concept, it was predicted that herbivore ecological efficiency should be higher in a food chain that has only two links, so herbivores and primary producers, compared to a food chain that has three links, which also includes the predators. Now, I mentioned that there isn't a huge amount of theory about herbivore efficiency, 
And I think there is even less empirical evidence. And I think that the reason for that is that it's quite difficult to come by data. And so, uh, for this reason, I, did, I set out to study some of the hypotheses that I mentioned earlier using data from Lake Lugano. Now, for those of you who are not familiar with it, Lake Lugano is a lake which is located right here at the southern tip of Switzerland, actually stretches into Italy. It's uh, probably a relatively small lake for this audience because it has a surface of uh, 50 square kilometers, but it's a deep lake with a maximum depth of 288 meters. Now, I thought that there are three main reasons why this lake is a good system to look at herbivore efficiency. And the first reason is that we have 35 years of monitoring data. The second reason uh, is that during these years there's been a lot of uh, ups and downs or a lot of year-to-year -year variation in the concentrations of phosphorus in the lake, as you can see here in this picture. And this is due to a combination of nutrient management in the catchment, but also some variation in the internal upwelling of phosphorus from the deeper layers which is essentially driven by climate. Now, a third reason is that uh, in the late 1980s, there was a major shift in the structure of the pelagic food chain in this lake. So, up to 1989, the herb or zooplankton of the lake was dominated by small species. And at the same time, the bleak, which is a small plantivorous fish, it's a pelagic fish, was abundant in the lake, and so as a result of that, presumably predation on plankton was also high. Now, after 1989, this was really quite abrupt, from one year to the next. The herbivores in the plankton became dominated by much larger species, which include a large Daphnia, it's Daphnia longispina galeata, and a copepod calamite, that's the Diaphthomus gracchis. Pretty much at the same time, the bleak, uh, which was abundant in the 80s, declined to functional extinction in the, in the early 90s. And as a result of that, I think that the predation on plankton also declined. So, uh, I'm going to refer to these two communities as the small grazer community before 1989 and the large grazer community after 1989. Now, based on the hypothesis I mentioned and the changes that we had in the lake, I made three specific predictions for my study. The first prediction was that the shift from the small grazer assemblage to the large grazer assemblage had a positive effect on herbivore efficiency. The second prediction was that phosphorus concentration also had a positive effect on efficiency. And my third prediction was that herbivore efficiency uh, or the year-to-year -year variation in herbivore efficiency was driven mainly by uh, variation in the production of Daphne. Now, uh, just two words about the methods. For this study I used data on primary production and also herbivore production from the lake. Primary production was measured in the lake using the light and dark bottle method with uh, C14 as a carbon tracer. Herbivore production was not measured, but it was estimated based on herbivore biomass using an empirical equation. Herbivore efficiency was calculated as the ratio between herbivore production and primary production in the lake, expressed um, as a percentage. Now, I'll walk you through some of the results that I got. And this first slide here summarizes most of the main results of the study. Here what I'm showing is the relationship between herbivore efficiency here on the y-axis and the concentration of phosphorus here on the x-axis. And I separated here the effects on the large herbivore assemblage, which is represented with these black solid circles, and uh, the small herbivore assemblage, which are represented here with these open white circles. Now, there are two main results that I wanted to show with this, uh, with this slide. The first is that for a same relatively high concentration of phosphorus in the lake, herbivore efficiency was higher for the large herbivore assemblage than for the small herbivore assemblage here. And the second result is that if we now focus just on the large herbivore assemblage for which we have more data, 
you can see that there is a positive and significant relationship between herbivore efficiency and phosphorus concentration. So the higher the phosphorus, the more efficient the transfer. Now, this uh, second slide here about the results shows the relationship between herbivore efficiency and the production of daphnia. And as you can see here, there was a positive significant relationship between the two. So it turns out that daphnia production was the main driver of herbivore efficiency in this. And finally, for the results, I want to show you the relationship between daphnia production, which is here on the y-axis, and the concentration of phosphorus, here on the x-axis, and the primary production in the lake, which is here on the x-axis. Now, what this uh, slide is showing us is that there was a positive relationship between the production of daphnia and the concentration of phosphorus in the lake, but there was no relationship between the production of daphnia and primary <coughs> production. So, in as much as uh, phosphorus concentration can be considered a proxy for the quality uh, of food for daphnia, this uh, result is telling us that daphnia was probably more controlled by food quality than by food quantity, which is represented here by primary production. Two words of discussion. So I would like to come back to my predictions in the light of these results. And I think that my three predictions were, with some caveats, they were supported by the results. Now, the first prediction was that the shift to the large grazing assemblage had a positive effect on the herbivore efficiency, and that was supported because, as we saw, this, this assemblage here, uh, with the big daphnia and the copepod colonoid, had higher efficiency for a same concentration of phosphorus uh, than this community here, which was dominated by uh, small herbivores. However, we could only test this for relatively high concentration of phosphorus because we didn't have the condition with low con concentration of phosphorus in this community at the same time in the lake. So the second prediction was that phosphorus concentration had a positive effect on herbivore efficiency. And again, uh, although this could only be tested for the large grazer assemblage, the results supported this, uh, this prediction that we saw that there was a positive relationship between herbivore efficiency uh, and phosphorus concentration. And then my third prediction was that uh, herbivore efficiency was driven essentially by the production of daphnia. That was also supported. Herbivore efficiency in this lake was not related so much to uh, primary production, but it was related to the production of herbivores and specifically to the production of daphnia. So what did I learn from this study? I started off with two relatively simple hypotheses, one from ecological stoichiometry and this one from uh, food chain theory. And I realized that these two hypotheses have some merit, however, individually, they cannot really explain the patterns of herbivore efficiency that we saw in the lake. And that is because even though there is a relationship between phosphorus concentration and herbivore efficiency, this relationship is modified by the structure of the food chain. So, I think that uh, a better explanation for what we saw in the lake can be built by assembling or combining these two hypotheses into a new framework, which is this one, where the relationship between herbivore efficiency and phosphorus can be either strong or weak, depending on the shape of the food web or the food chain. So, more specifically, I think that if we have uh, a two-linked food chain where predation is weak and the herbivores uh, exist in high abundance, and especially we have large herbivores like large daphnia, then in this case we can expect to find this strong relationship between herbivore efficiency and phosphorus as predicted by this stoichiometric hypothesis. However, if we have high predation, and we have a limited uh, or limited populations of herbivores, and especially we have small herbivores, which are probably more less efficient. In that case, I think that the relationship between phosphorus and, or between uh, herbivore efficiency and phosphorus would be much weaker, more similar to this line here. 
So I think that this is perhaps a good example of how we can combine some elements coming from ecological stoichiometry with some elements coming from food chain theory to gain some greater understanding of how this system works. And this is something that we would like to pursue in the future. Just finishing by thanking all the people that contributed to the databases that I've been using for this and other studies, and thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, it should go back up because uh, in reality, I, I mean, I simplified a bit these ideas for, for, for the talk, but um, when I talk about uh, the effects of predation, in reality, uh, I think we should talk about the length of the food chain and the number of links that you have in the food chains. So, um, if we think in terms of the number of links in the food chain, I think that if you add another level, so you have uh, a food chain with four links that should behave in terms of trophic efficiency so the transfer between the plants and the herbivores that should behave in a way that is similar to a two-linked um, food chain so the difference should be between the even linked and the odd linked uh, chains Some invertebrate predators in the lakes. Do you have some uh, cowboys, or some invertebrate predators? Yeah, we do. We do have predators. We have uh, mitotrephes that just recently invaded. Well, invaded is not the right word, but uh, colonized the lake. Although it's still kind of unstable in terms of the, the densities that we are seeing, and we have Leptodora that has been there since forever, I think, in the lake. Um, it would be interesting to look at the effects of those, but I think that the main effect here is really the predation by fish, because I think that the predation of fish is really what can determine whether you have one type of herbivore assemblage or another. I think, although I have no proof of that, but I do really think that uh, the shift that we saw in the lake <coughs> So when we went from this community dominated by small herbivores to the one dominated by the big Daphnia and the copepod carnoid was driven by the decline in the in, in bleak abundance. I don't think that changes in the uh, invertebrate predators will have such a dramatic effect. What caused the decline of bleak? Uh, there are several, this is a very good question, and there are several hypotheses for that. Uh, it's possible that uh, there were some diseases at the time, that there was a loss of uh, spawning area in the lake, or a degradation of the spawning habitat for this fish. It is also possible, and this, I think, is where it becomes really interesting, that the decline of bleak is itself related to phosphorus concentration, so that the bleak was there, it was abundant when phosphorus concentration were quite high. Uh, perhaps one thing that uh, we should point out is that um, when the bleak was present, so up until the 1980s, phosphorus concentration were consistently high in the lake. After it declined, phosphorus concentration went down overall because of nutrient management, but you still have these peaks going up. And that is because sometimes you have upwelling of phosphorus from the deeper layer. So it's an internal loading that comes up and enriches the lake. So it's two different situations. But it's, uh, it's interesting to consider that the presence of bleak itself, and so the, the shift in the, in the length of the food chain, could be related to phosphorus concentration.
Okay, our next presenter is Howard Reeson, who's going to talk on body size, climate change, and cyclopoid predation on Daphne. Thank you very much. Uh, today, today, I want to talk about the potential impacts of uh, large predatory uh, cyclopoid copepods on the population uh, dynamics of the different size Daphne. And it's been known for a long, long time that the cyclopoid copepods are highly uh, size selective. Um, they have feed on small zooplankton, and among Daphnia, they're going to be feeding on the, uh, the early instars, the smallest instars, and not so much uh, when they get bigger. The question then is not so much um, their, their potential impact on uh, the feeding rate of cyclopoids, but uh, how does the size selective predation influence the population dynamics of, of different size uh, Daphnia species? So, what I've done is to divide up the Daphnia into three size classes here. Uh, very small Daphnia, whose size at first reproduction is less than or equal to one millimeter in size. Large Daphnia, where the size at first reproduction is 1.2 to 1.3 millimeters. And very large Daphnia, which are very, very large. Uh, we're not going to talk about these because they're so large that um, cyclopoids have very uh, little impact on them. So we're going to be focusing on small in these large Daphnia, which would include um, Daphnia ambigua, North American species, Daphnia cupulata, European species for small Daphnia, and uh, Daphnia catawba, again, North American species, and Daphnia hyalina, which would be a European species. And what impact might cyclopoids have, or how much difference might there be on these the different size Daphnia? So the questions be looking at today are, uh, what's the relative impact of cyclopoid predation on the population dynamics of these small and large Daphnia? And then what effect might increased water temperature have on, on this uh, dynamic as well? So the, this is a model. I don't have any actual real data, but this is a model based on lots of other people's data. And uh, it's a stage classified matrix model for Daphnia where the stages are instars. The dominant eigenvalue of the matrix is uh, lambda, and that's, uh, I'll convert into a little r, which is the per capita population growth rate. And the model includes all of these features, which I'm going to go through very, very quickly, because I don't want to take up too much time. Uh, but basically, body size is um, body size determined by the phenotype. It's either large or small, and water temperature. Uh, increased water temperatures reduce body size. And then the growth rate, here you see a study by uh, Craig Williamson showing that size of first reproduction for Daphne Cotaba uh, uh, decreases with increases in body temperature. And so the model growth looks like this with a small phenotype and a large phenotype. And in each case at 25 degrees Celsius versus 22 degrees Celsius, the body sizes are going to be smaller in each instar. Uh, development time or instar duration is determined by water temperature. And we use a function that's similar to this one here. So it's increased temperature, uh, reduces the age of maturity and the length of each instar. Uh, fecundity, or clutch size, is determined by adult body length. And I, I uh, modeled a logistic function for this that basically maxed out um, clutch size at about 11 eggs per animal, at very large animals, and then parameterized this using uh, data from uh, Alan Tessier's study in 1986 on Daphne Catawba. So these, these values are uh, from real lake samples, not, not um, laboratory feeding studies. Uh, fish predation plays obviously an important role in this, and so I've modeled in a, a, a background fish predation, and obviously um, the vulnerability is going to increase with, with body size, and I borrowed uh, a function from the Taylor and Gabriel paper so that the probability of survival uh, decreases in this fashion with uh, increased Daphne body length. And if you, the effect of that basically in the model for small and large phenotypes at these temperatures uh, is basically about a 20% decrease in the per capita population growth rate with this background fish predation put in, which is essentially sort of a moderate level of fish predation. And then obviously the end, uh, we're looking at the effect of cyclopoid predation this is a function of the encounter rate between predator and prey, which is affected by uh, prey swimming speeds. Um, and they're a function of prey body length, so larger 
the Daphne swim faster, and water temperatures, the Daphne swim faster at higher temperatures, and then the vulnerability following an encounter is determined by prey body length. So what I basically did is I, I took these data from a 1994 paper by Glivich and Yamana and deconstructed the data that they published and produced from this a probability function that shows the probability of Daphne being eaten per predator per liter per day and using the three different size species that they did we came up with this function which goes into the matrix model. And then the whole model looks something like this where Daphne body size which is determined by a large or small phenotype it's also affected by, can be affected by food environment and water temperature and Daphne body size affects uh, fish predation, it affects a cyclopoid predation, and all of these get intertwined in various interesting ways. So what's the relative impact of cyclopoid predation on these two different uh, size phenotypes? So these are the main results of that for the small and large phenotypes. Cyclopoid densities of zero, that is no cyclopoid predation, versus a density of 10 per liter. And the effect then, in terms of the percent decrease in per capita population growth rate, is about 37% uh, decrease for the small phenotype, about 22% decrease for the large phenotype. But how does this translate then into population dynamics of Daphne in the lake? And to look at this, basically what I did was interpreted those little r values um, in following the patterns that are, that are typical, but not universal, but typical that you might see in a temperate lake. And so I, I basically, again, looked at these data for uh, Daphne Catawba, again, from this paper by Tessier. And what he found was that there were, there were peaks of Daphne in the spring and then in late summer, and a depression in between. And these peaks of Daphne sort of leveled off at about 10 per liter. That's sort of the, the carrying capacity in this particular lake, at least. And that it took about a month or so for the Daphne to increase rapidly to those uh, carrying capacities. So what I'm interested in is what's happening in this rapid period of population growth and what might cyclopoids have to say about uh, whether Daphne can actually do that or not. So here are the results, first results, for um, the growth model at 22 degrees with a carrying capacity of 10 per liter. For the large phenotype, you notice, of course, and I'm sorry, the blue, the blue line is no, no cyclopoid predation, the, the red line is a 10 per liter cyclopoids. Uh, the large phenotype obviously is going to have some effect on, on um, the population growth rate of death here, but it's relatively modest. And if you grow the animal for 30 days during this rapid growth period, by the end of that time, you don't see much difference in, in density between um, the Daphnia under this, those uh, two cyclopoid predation uh, models. For the small phenotype, on the other hand, there's a huge difference. By 30 days with no cyclopoid predation, it can pretty much reach its carrying capacity, but under cyclopoid predation, the densities can only get to maybe half of what they otherwise would be. Now, if you increase the carrying capacity from uh, 10 to 20 per liter, you get basically the same results, but even a greater uh, difference. So for the small phenotype, um, it can get close to its carrying capacity, but under uh, heavy cyclopoid predation, the densities are only about a third of what you would get uh, without that level of predation pressure. And this, uh, this large effect of cyclopoid predation and other invertebrate predators on, um, on small daphnia then results in the uh, production of these uh, large induced uh, morphological defenses such as helmets, especially in the smaller daphnia species like Daphne cupulata and Daphne recurva, uh, to try to combat that level of cyclopoid predation. Now the other question I want to look at is what effect might increased water temperature have? We're living in a world of, of climate change. And if you increase water temperature over here, you're going to decrease Daphnia body size. You're also going to increase encounter rate to some degree because of increased swimming speeds. That's going to affect cyclopoid predation, and you might predict that that would then uh, result in a decrease in population growth rate because of heavier cyclopoid predation. But water temperature has other effects as well. Body size has other effects on clutch size, and water temperature has effects on development time. 
when you integrate all this together, what you end up with is just the opposite of what you might predict. That is, there is an actual a slight increase in population growth rate at 25 degrees Celsius, about a 10 to 15 percent increase for both small and large daphnia, and that's largely a function of the fact that at those warmer temperatures, the development rate speeds up, and the age of first reproduction is decreased significantly. And so if you look at this again, growing over that one month period, um, they do grow a little faster at 25 degrees, but there's not a whole lot of difference here uh, for either the small or large phenotype. Now, bear in mind, of course, that this is a model, and models are only good in the sense, no matter how well you put them together, in terms of the data that go into the various parameterizations. And sometimes that's rather difficult, and so sometimes you need some assistance in terms of making sure that your models are correct. What's most important here is that um, the functions for fecundity, for vulnerability of fish predation, and growth rate functions all can vary from what I put in, and that will have uh, some effect, as well as the um, one month period of logistic population growth, which I limited to in this particular model. And then, in terms of the temperature effect, uh, I assumed here that the Daphnia can physiologically tolerate temperatures up to 25 degrees Celsius, as well as they could at 22, which may or may not actually be true in, in reality. Thank you. of um, evolution of Daphnia body size in response to predation and, and how that might play into the dynamics. The evolution of body size? The, like the, the actual evolution over, over time as opposed to phenotypic yeah, response. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well that's, sure. I mean there's large species and small species and if you, I'm sure that if you subject um, small species solely to um, Invertebrate predation, cycloid predation, and that's going to have an impact. Uh, the opposite impact is if you've been subjecting them to fish predation, and that they would tend to mature at a larger size and uh, probably um, produce um, larger, larger eggs on, on top of that as well. Now, that's not included in this model at all, but over the long term, of course, that would be an important, important point. Yeah, yeah, just curious. Fish predation was not temperature dependent. That was solely size dependent. And, and obviously, you know, if you, if you increase the temperature, you can increase the feeding rate of not only the fish, but the cyclopoids. That isn't taken into account as well. So this, it's a limited model in that respect, but it's, it's based upon the information that I could actually sort of cram into that. You're quite correct. Thank you for your talk. Uh, does your model include temperature effects on primary production? So what about bottom-up effects? No, it doesn't include any, any of that at all, which of course would be important. Um, it's, it's solely to sort of a, a two-tiered uh, model looking at uh, predator and prey and not looking at all at the uh, effect of, um, say, phytoplankton or other types of food sources on the adapt. You must be as tired as, as me, but I, I hope I can wake you up with these dramatic events in, in our food, food web. Um, uh, fish, uh, zooplankton, phytoplankton interactions really uh, seem to play 
really important role in, in uh, controlling water quality of Lake Pyhäjärvi. Uh, but here in this uh, presentation, I will a little bit uh, discuss if that's the case always and, and uh, how it, has, it may have changed. Um, Pyhäjärvi is situated in southwestern Finland and uh, it is 154 square kilometers in size, quite shallow, mean depth of 5.4 meters. And uh, it is situated in agricultural area, so, so, um, so um, there are not other lakes in the catchment and, and the, the, these uh, incoming rivers are the, the most important um, source of, of nutrient load. It is a mesotrophic lake, as you can see, still, uh, still uh, in a good ecological state. Uh, and uh, there has been some, uh, some eutrophication, uh, especially in the 80s, but it has been quite stable during the last years. And uh, certainly it is at the risk of eutrophication. So uh, when the water quality is good, it is very clear, but, but immediately if something, uh, it is immediately visible if, if there are some changes, for example, in the load or whatever. So, so, um, so in that sense, um, there is really drama sometimes. There has been long-term restoration program where also I have been working for many years, uh, and uh, it has uh, uh, content, uh, typical content, so that we have been working in the catchment, reducing nutrients. Um, Many kind of water protection measures have been implemented, but, but then there's also the management of the lake that I am mainly concentrating now. We are using commercial fishery as a tool for bioregulation, and, uh, and uh, that, that's uh, now also the topic of this talk. Education and communication, we have research and monitoring in the, in the program. And we also have more than 60 professional fishermen in this lake, and, and of course they are the top predators of the system. And this kind of very classic uh, food, ch food uh, chain has been, has been the concept. Uh, it is quite well studied, uh, and, and, and the idea is that, that um, phytoplankton is normally uh, or, or, or if, if the Daphnia, Daphnia is abundant enough, they, they are controlling phytoplankton. But we have planktivorous uh, fish that may be very abundant, and then again they are uh, they are controlling Daphnia, and then the fishery um, predatory fish are then possibly controlling. Plantivorous fish stock. So, uh, Vende is, uh, is not a uh, native species in this system, but it was introduced in the 50s, and we have a uh, paleolimnological re uh, result showing that, uh, that uh, this introduction uh, had very negative effect on, on uh, uh, Daphnia length and also the water quality. Uh, introduction of Vendes uh, was clearly reducing the length of Daphnia. Uh, this was uh, found from the sediment. And also in the, in the uh, neolimnological uh, results we can show that there is a negative correlation with the mean length of, of Daphnia and then this uh, intensity of planktivory. We are using this uh, planktivory index which is the weight of uh, zero plus uh, when in, in autumn. Uh, um, uh, um, my, uh, 100 minus the, the, the uh, biomass. So uh, the eutrophication development is most uh, clearly seen in this uh, development of, of phytoplankton biomass. And, and here, uh, after 2000, we, we got funding from EU and there was very intensive biomanipulation 
project and, and here you can really see the, the top-down uh, effect of, of this uh, biomanipulation. Redu there was clear reduction in, in uh, phytoplankton uh, biomass and, and there, uh, there were some years with low, low external load but, but clearly, clearly this biomanipulation bio worked here. Uh, and also, um, there was uh, the ratio between large cladoserans uh, and uh, total phytoplankton biomass uh, uh, versus uh, planktivory index is showing that uh, the lowest grazing threshold to plankton occurred in years when planktivory fish were abundant. But, uh, but uh, although it seems really clear that, that in these years there was uh, the, this, this uh, food web was, was working, but, uh, but things are really changing. Our water temperature is increasing clearly and we are, we are losing our ice cover. Normally the lake is, is covered uh, by ice and uh, before the two, year two, 2000 it was 147 days. But after, after that, it has re reduced already one month, and, and we have had years with, uh, with the really short ice cover and also very bad quality ice. So uh, that is, of course, changing many things in, in, in the system, like light condition. Uh, uh, it is much more open to, to uh, spring and autumn winds, and, and many things are changing. Uh, uh, we made a, a multivariate analysis for for uh, phytoplankton, and it showed that here the increase, especially increase of planktotrichs, it was linked to to uh, climate change variables, and and this is not surface uh, bloom forming. Type, it is in the deeper layer, so it is not really visible for the, for example, for um, lake users or recreational users. But but it is in the deeper uh, column and and um, and may um, of course have some other uh, ecosystem effects. Um, but now here uh, I'm comparing these years. Uh, 14, 15, and 16 with, with more traumatic events. And um, here, uh, here we have a, a herbivorous uh, zooplankton uh, carbon con car uh, biomass for cladocera and colonoids, and, and especially here in uh, uh, 2016, there was really high planktivory index, and it, as you can see, uh, there was uh, really uh, low biomass of, of these two plankton, and, and that was quite dramatic. It was all, all even in the Finnish national news that we have, we have lost our our two plankton. Um, but first, uh, 2014, it was uh, almost no load. It was very clear water quality. Uh, low pho phosphorus, low uh, nitrogen, uh, good secchi depth, uh, and it was due to this uh, almost zero load and, and flow. 2015, on the other hand, it was otherwise normal year, but, but uh, uh, in November, almost in winter, there was, uh, this is the only only bad bloom of cyanobacteria we have ever had, and it was uh, by Afanitsomenon, uh, also not very abundant species, uh, species in, in this lake earlier. So so it was um, it was uh, really something new. So back in 2016, uh, this is when the zooplankton community collapsed. And uh, here uh, we made uh, we made some uh, fatty acid uh, analysis in, in this year, and uh, the analysis showed that it was not only that uh, there were really many uh, 
small fish uh, from several species. They, they were not only hunted by these fish, but also limited by uh, food quality, especially sterols uh, and these fatty acids, because the cyanobacteria don't contain any sterols, and, and the, the, so there is a steroid limitation during the cyanobacterial dominance. And as you can see uh, in the in the um, early spring, in, in summer, June, July, uh, the phytoplankton community was uh, dominated by diatoms, uh, and then the, the cyanobacteria here in, in darker uh, green became dominant uh, in, in from the beginning of August. But surprisingly, when we, we look at the uh, Cladocera diet, this has been this is based on fatty acids uh, uh, measurements, and, and uh, this kind of FASTAR model has been used. You can read about these publications if you if you want to learn about it. And uh, surprisingly, it showed that he, even here, although we were not able to see uh, any cyanobacteria in our phytoplankton samples, they, they were still uh, still found in the diet. <coughs> But it was it was uh, small cells, probably some pico algae, but also single cells of anabena here, and uh, cladoceras were eating it. But it was really poor uh, uh, quality food. And here, when the when the uh, cyanobacteria, the bigger cells like plankton were dominant, zooplankton uh, uh, was not feeding on on um, cyanobacteria, and the quality of, of food was here uh, in the diet was, was increasing, but they were not feeding on, on these big uh, cyanobacteria uh, species. So just quickly that, uh, that it, now this year in spring we studied the, the uh, number of newly hatched when they fry, and it was the highest uh, during the 2000s, and how was the water quality? Where it was very special summer. It was the warmest uh, ever. Very warm uh, water temperature. Low number of Daphnia again, but it was clear water. So, so the the food chain, as uh, we think, was not really working. There were no algae blooms at, at yet, at least not yet. Uh, and uh, what uh, what we were thinking that it, uh, the because of this reduced uh, ice cover length, the role of uh, littoral zone and role of benthic al algae must have changed. They are more light. Uh, the, the water level is also lower, and and it seems that uh, the nutrients are taken by by somebody else than than uh, plantic algae. So my conclusions, yes, uh, this zooplankton phytoplankton interaction plays a key role, but there are certainly big annual differences and things are changing. And this phytoplankton co community is uh, strongly affected by climate change and, and it, it has already become dominated by cyanobacterial species, like plankton tricks and afanitsunenon, and, and they, that's poor quality food for zooplankton. And then, as we are using biomanipulation as a tool for management, this, uh, these changes are diminishing the trophic cascade effect of the biomanipulation. It seems that this fatty acid analysis is a very good tool for me, more detailed understanding of the food web, and, and we get uh, information who, who exactly is eating whom. Unfortunately, I didn't have time to go into the detail, but, but it, is, it is producing uh, really uh, nice detailed information. And then this role of littoral zone, it seems that this decreased length of ice cover, there is more light, and, and this benthic algae, macrophytes, filamentous algae, are taking a bigger role in this ecosystem. And, so far, it seems that it is it is in this kind of clear water state, uh, and and uh, and that what we have observed. 
and also uh, there has been dry years with low water level and again that is reducing the amount of light. So uh, finally I, I think that, that all these are saying that, that uh, for example in our monitoring or in our research we are probably focusing uh, quite limited part because we have been focusing on pelagic food web and, and uh, and not too much information about the, the, the literal zone is available, but we have to improve that. Thank you. Questions? So, I understand that the, the fishery is a ice fishery. So is that going to disappear when there's no more ice? Yeah, uh, it used to be so. That was the case uh, 10 years ago. But it, uh, the fishery has been forced to adapt uh, climate change. And nowadays, uh, the most of the, the catch is taken from open water fishery. So, so that was a very dramatic situation like 10 years ago when we were losing ice and, and we, we thought that the, the fishing pressure would collapse. But but fishermen are not very clever and, and they just adapt new methods and now, now it's more efficient than ever. Also the, also the biomanipulation nowadays, commercial fishery, we are not subsidizing anything but it's commercially um, profitable. Yeah, thank you. Uh, did I understand correctly that um, there was a disconnect based on the fatty acid analysis between the a seasonal disconnect between the food quality and the phytoplankton and, and what you see in the cladosteries. Does that can you say a little bit more about that? Uh, you mean this one? Uh, so yes, it uh, it was a little bit surprising that here in, uh, when you look at the phytoplankton community, so cyanobacteria are not visible here. But when you when you look at this um, this um, diet, so it, it is still visible there, and so it seems that maybe it is taken up by zooplankton so efficiently that it's not in our samples. And and uh, what I found that it was uh, it was uh, mainly the single. Uh, 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 it was not uh, uh, just single uh, cells that, that so so they are in a good size to eat, to be eaten, and when it changed to these big bigger uh, bigger species, then then they were, it's also physically impossible to for for the smaller Daphnia to eat from the tricks. <coughs> was that your question? Yes, because they are then feeding on good quality, better quality food because they, they uh, but these are also species that are not very, we have, haven't thought them to be uh, important in, in the system because they are not very abundant. So, so abundancy and, and what they are eating they are something separate. So the next speaker is Thomas Hook, who is going to talk about fish productivity, large lakes. Okay, so uh, first off, the, what I'm going to talk about today is work in collaboration with a large number of people. Uh, many of you are listed here. A couple of you may be in the room, Sir Bruce Chesney and, and uh, Jacques Grinchard. Um, uh, I also want to point out that this talk is going to be a little bit different from some of the other talks. I'm not going to talk about a specific system or really have a lot of set forth a hypothesis for testing. Rather, it's going to be more of a survey demonstrating spatial variation and production pathways that support fish in large lakes. So looking across different lakes. Um, for simplicity, upper food webs are often um, depicted in large lakes as being spatially uniform. So, for instance, 
This is a uh, image that uh, NOAA Great Lakes Environmental Research Lab uh, uses to depict the Lake Michigan food web. Uh, and clearly, this sort of thing is inappropriate. In the Laurentian Great Lakes, there's been a lot of focus over the last couple of decades on variation between pelagic and benthic uh, production and nearshore versus offshore production supporting um, the food web. One thing that we've been working on in our lab together with a number of collaborators is exploring regional differences within large lakes and in particular focusing on intraspecific variation across regions uh, in terms of differences in foraging patterns and the relative importance of different production pathways that are supporting fish. To do so, we've been using a variety of different diet indices, uh, including stomach contents, fatty acids, isotopes, mercury, uh, morphological analyses. I won't go into these different methods in detail, but in brief, stomach contents is a way of, of getting a fairly high taxonomic resolution of what fish are eating, uh, but only depicts what they're eating over a very short time frame, whereas isotopes, uh, carbon-13, uh, nitrogen-15, and then also uh, hydrogen and oxygen are more long-term measures of what fish have been eating, but really provide uh, a lot less taxonomic resolution. So using these tools, we've been exploring questions such as the consistency of spatial structuring. The, the stomach contents uh, reveal the same thing about spatial structuring as isotopes. Are there seasonal, seasonal and annual effects that change the spatial structuring of food webs over time? Um, differences among species are, are trophic levels. Are fish species uh, structured spatially in a similar way? And then are there differences in trophic levels? This image here on the bottom right is from a paper by McMeans et al. Uh, and they argue that in general, as you move up a food web to top pisivores, uh, pisivores will integrate over large spaces and not show a lot of trophic structuring, whereas uh, invertebores, lower trophic level fish, will show more spatial uh, structuring. And then we're interested in exploring drivers of regional spatial structuring and, and even the management implications of the structure. So today I'm going to talk about three different systems. Uh, first off, uh, large lakes in Sweden. Uh, then I'm going to talk about Saginaw Bay, a large bay in Lake Huron, and then Lake Michigan. So in terms of large lakes in Sweden, we're uh, looking at smelt in these large lakes. Um, and this work includes uh, looking at Vettin, the second largest lake in Sweden, Madden, the third largest lake in, yeah, the Madden, the uh, fourth largest lake in the country. The top right image here is for, is for Madden, and, and Madden um, drains uh, the middle part of Sweden and empties out into the Baltic right around Stockholm. Uh, and there's a gradient of uh, going from more eutrophic in the inner part of Madden to more oligotrophic as you move uh, east towards Stockholm. And so we've been looking at smelt across these three lakes, but in particular in that, and looking at these three different basins that are expected to have different, uh, that are along this eutrophic to oligotrophic gradient. And so we've looked at a number of fatty acids in smelt uh, across these different locations. Here, for simplicity, I'm just going to show one, which is uh, EPA. So you have here uh, the three lakes, yeah, Madden, Madden, and Bethan going from a gradient from eutrophic to oligotrophic. The three in the middle are um, the um, different basins of Madden. And really, the EPA content in smelt from these different locations line up very well with what you might expect um, based upon past work, which suggests that EPA in uh, consumers can be positively related to agricultural inputs. Um, so these patterns line up with what one might expect. And if you focus on uh, the values in that, and also suggest that smelt in different parts of this lake are feeding, uh, are relying on different uh, production pathways. Here is the same sort of pattern looking not at uh, a fatty acid, but rather looking at nitrogen isotope ratios uh, at these same sites. And uh, delta 15N has also been shown to be positive related to agricultural input. <coughs> And so we would expect a similar sort of gradient uh, across these sites in nitrogen isotope ratios. And for the most part, we see that. The one um, location that's a little bit different is Lam Barfiaden here, which is a site, uh, a basin that's right next to Stockholm. And we suspect that there's probably 
some um, nitrogen sources here that are anthropogenic, um, that are having a similar effect as uh, agriculture further up in the lake. Switching gears now to from uh, Europe to North America, looking at inner Saginaw Bay and focusing on H0 yellow perch. Uh, Saginaw Bay is a mesoeutrophic embayment uh, of Lake Huron. It's, I think this bay is larger than any of the lakes in Sweden. Um, it's, um, the Saginaw River is the main tributary, which comes in right at the inner part of the bay. This uh, river drains a large agricultural watershed. Um, Saginaw Bay also supports commercial and recreational yellow perch fisheries, and when we started this study, there were concerns about limited recruitment of yellow perch uh, in the bay. And we uh, undertook collections during 2009-2010 and uh, focused not only on young perch, but also their potential prey of both zooplankton and benthic invertebrates, and we looked at these four different sites here. And so this plot from a paper a few years ago shows uh, differences over two different years and, and different seasons in those years in zooplankton densities across sites. And you can see that there are some differences in the densities and types of zooplankton at different sites, but also there was a decrease in overall zooplankton density from 2009 to 2010. If you look at benthic invertebrates collected at these same sites, we see also that there are, are different patterns um, across different sites. For some sites there are more coronome larvae, some sites there are more uh, drysinids. But also there was an overall increase across the two years in terms of benthic invertebrates at these sites. And then finally, if you look at what the, we actually found in the stomach contents of fish during these two different years at these different sites, uh, we found uh, strong differences in what fish were eating at different sites. And these were fairly consistent across the year. So if you look at site 2 here and site 10, you can see a, a contrast with site 2 relying a lot more on daphnia and site 10 relying a lot more on coronavids. And this was true not only in 2009, but also in 2010. So based on this, if we look at isotopic values, we might expect that across our different sites, we would see big differences in um, Carbon isotope ratio is consistent with relying on pelagic production or benthic production. And that's not quite what you see. We do see differences in sites. We do see variation in sites, um, which um, is primarily driven by nitrogen. So these small points here are individual fish. The larger points are uh, the means for different sites and years. So the, um, the reds are site 10 greens, site 14, blues, uh, site twos. The closed symbols are 2009, the open symbols are 2010. And so you'll see here that there's a difference across sites based on nitrogen, and in particular, changing as you move from the inner bay, which is highly influenced by uh, discharge from the river, including a lot of agricultural runoff uh, towards the outer part of the inner bay. But also there was this interesting change in year. Um, where we saw a change in carbon from 2009 to 2010. And this might be related to what I showed in the previous graph with the change in the availability of, of prey. All right, so, so finally, uh, Lake Michigan. This is the system that uh, we've explored regional variation in um, production pathways the most. Uh, and we published a number of papers uh, based on the near shore food web in Lake Michigan and comparing different locations um, in Lake Michigan. And essentially what those studies have shown is that the western part of Lake Michigan, uh, small body fish are heavily reliant on benthic pathways for fish produ for production, whereas the eastern part of Lake Michigan, uh, fish are far more reliant on pelagic pathways. And this is evident based on looking at stomach contents, fatty acids, and um, stable isotopes. And one thing that's noteworthy here uh, is that the eastern basin receives a lot more river inputs than uh, the western part of the eastern side of, of Lake Michigan receives a lot more river inputs than the western side of the lake. And we think this may be part of what's driving some of these differences. So today I want to highlight um, a study that we haven't published yet where we looked at different sites in Lake Michigan using uh, water isotopes, using uh, oxygen and hydrogen isotope ratios. And the first thing I want to point out is 
if we look at water isotope ratios, these are analyzing hydrogen and oxygen isotopes from water samples collected from throughout uh, Lake Michigan, there's clear variation. So this seems to be a potential way to uh, differentiate fish that are feeding in different locations. So for instance, these two sites in the southwestern part of Lake Michigan really stand out from some of the other sites. <clears throat> and if we look at the hydrogen and oxygen, but here just showing uh, hydrogen uh, isotopic ratios of young perch collected in near shore Lake Michigan, they roughly follow these um, differences in uh, water isotope ratios, where we see that the eastern sites here in blue have uh, particularly high delta 2 H values, and the southwestern sites have particularly low delta 2 H values. Also note that there is an influence of total length here, so as fish grow, uh, they, uh, there is a, and as they uh, eat at higher trophic levels, there seems to be a fractionation effect which also influences delta H values. And then finally, <laughs> moving up the food web to look not only at these smaller invertebrate fishes, but also uh, piscivorous fishes. And here we're looking at, at four regions of Lake Michigan, uh, northwest, northeast, southwest, and southeast, and focusing on, on four species, two introduced uh, piscivores, Chinook salmon and rainbow trout, and two native piscivores, lake trout and bourbon. Um, if we look at what they're eating, um, for the most part, these different species are eating similar things <laughs> based on stomach content analysis in different regions. So Chinook salmon are relying heavily on alewives regardless of where they are in the lake. Burbot are relying heavily on round goby regardless of where they are in the lake. There's some variation with, uh, between, for lake trout and rainbow trout, but um, those two also rely heavily on alewives. If we look, based on this, we might expect that consistent with the hypothesis that McMeans put forth and that I highlighted at the beginning of the talk, that as these fish move around and they're eating similar things, they might essentially integrate uh, what they're eating. And we may not see much variation in terms of the production pathways that are supporting these different species of fish in the different regions of Lake Michigan. And that's in fact what we see for Chinook salmon, rainbow trout, and lake trout to a large extent. But in particular, bourbon really seem to have uh, a uh, very region-specific signature <coughs> and don't seem to be integrating across the lake the way that the other species do. So just to wrap up, I want to come back to the questions that I started off with and, and just point out some things from the data that I just showed you. So we were interested in looking at the consistency of, of spatial structure, structuring and whether or not there are seasonal and annual effects. And so clearly there, are, there is some consistent spatial patterns. Um, for instance, in Lake Michigan, we see that uh, there's a consistent pattern across a number of invertebrate species, species between the eastern part of the, of the lake and the western part of the lake. But there's also evidence of changes across seasons and years. And in particular, in, in Saginaw Bay, we saw this change from one year to the next, consistent with changes in the relative abundance of, of zooplankton and benthic invertebrates. There are some differences among species or trophic levels, and in particular, this. Uh, Last slide that I showed demonstrating that unlike other piscivores in Lake Michigan, bourbon are really seem to be uh, developing this region-specific isotopic signature. And then in terms of drivers of regional spatial structuring, um, we've looked at a number of, of, of um, different species in, in different uh, regions of the Great Lakes. Uh, and to a large part, we end up sort of speculating in terms of what the drivers of the spatial structure. And a lot of what I showed today seems to be related to tributary inputs, and differences in tributary inputs in different parts of these large lakes seem to influence what the, do what the dominant um, production pathway is. But there's also some indication that water clarity, substrate, upwell upwellings, and other things are important as they influence the foraging behavior of fish and who the dominant primary producers are in different regions. Thanks. We can take some questions. Yes. Okay. Uh, 
I was curious about the Herbert and the Gobies. So, do, have you done any isotopes on the Gobies? Do they show that same pattern that you saw in the Herbert? Yeah, so I think the gobies, that's what's driving a lot of the difference in the verbit is that the gobies are uh, developing a very region-specific signature. But there are other species that do too. So they'll watch to a lesser extent the verbit, but they do too. Um, and lake trout in some locations eat a lot of gobies too. So it's, it's interesting that verbit get that very region-specific signature and other ones don't. Which may have to do with how mobile they are. And so the other, the salmonids may be swimming around a lot more. Uh, the other so that was the question I was going to ask. Thomas. Uh, so the the original the means argument was that about mobility of the predators or was it something else behind it? It was I think it's in a combination of mobility and also foraging flexibility and the idea that they can that predators are able to switch and eat a bunch of different things in different locations. So it's a combination of the two I think. What about that? So like, yeah, so predators are um, growing a lot slower. They could be turning over uh, a lot longer. But I don't think that it'd be that much longer of a turnover uh, ratio in predators versus things like an adult goby. Some of the earlier work on isotopes in, in ecological studies show the importance of correcting for baseline. Um, so, you know, in a way that kind of hides some of the underlying variation uh, here. Uh, but I guess your work just sort of reinforces the importance of doing that, depending on, on you know, what you're looking at. Right. I think that the base. It kind of depends on what the question is. If you're trying to reconstruct who's eating who, then you have to you have to correct for the baseline, right? But if your question is, what's the ultimate source of nitrogen that's supporting different fish, it's a different question, right? So yeah, if, you're, if the question is trying to reconstruct the food web, then yes, I think it's very important. And it's important that you can take region-specific baselines, too, because they're not, you can't assume. That's what, yeah, some of that really work that's really kind of So we can move to the next speaker, who is Maud Otier. subject of my master's degree. So I have studied uh, the comparative biology and uh, ecology of two fish species of the Lake Kivu. So the Lake Kivu is uh, located between uh, the Rwanda and uh, the Democratic Republic of the Congo. It measures uh, 2,700 square kilometers and uh, four Hundred ninety meters of depth. These features uh, make it a meromictic lake. That means um, the surface water doesn't mix with the depth water. Um, this lake has a particular. Uh, this lake has uh, also the particularity to contain um, allow fish species uh, diversity. Uh, until uh, 1958, um, 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 there were no fish in the uh, offshore water, and um, and uh, since then, uh, um, the offshore water is uh, occupied by uh, Limnotrusa myodon, uh, fish species uh, native to the lake Tanganyika. Limnotrusa 
has become the majority species in the Lake Kivu. It, it is widely consumed, around 10,000 tons uh, fish each year, and gives uh, work to uh, 2,000 uh, fishermen. So uh, the study and the conservation of these species represent uh, social and ecological issues. Many studies ha have been made on uh, Limnotrisa. This species has a rapid growth and live uh, two or three years in the Lake Kivu. Um, the individuals change habitats uh, according to development uh, um, stages. The larva live uh, in inshore water and progressively migrate uh, uh, in off offshore water during growth. Then um, this species is uh, zooplanctivorous and uh, occasionally feeds on uh, the macroinvertebrates, insects and uh, small fishes. Since uh, 2006, a new fish species uh, has been discovered, Lamprectis tanganicanus, also native to the lake uh, Tanganyika. Um, the exploitation of this species is very low and uh, and uh, the growth of these studies has never been uh, studied. Um, however, we know uh, this, species, this species is present in uh, inshore water and uh, has a similar diet of uh, Limnotrisa. It uh, feeds on uh, zooplankton too. Since the discovery of uh, Lamprectis, uh, we, we are asking us um, if Limnotrisa is uh, straightened, if there are a competition between the two species, in which case it could be, um, it could be a repercussion on the local uh, population and uh, the ecology of uh, the lake. So the study consists of two parts. Specify the biology and the ecology of two species and assess the interactions. To reach um, this uh, objective, a um, growth study has been, has been uh, set up uh, by means of two methods. Firstly, the autolithometries required um, development, uh, methodological development of protocols, and secondly, the size frequency distributions model. Then, um, the feeding behavior analyses have been made uh, thanks to praise contributions of uh, um, praise contribution study. And the uh, trophic position and isotopic niche of the lab have been made uh, to assess uh, their interaction. So, this study is focused on uh, two locations in Rwanda the north basin of uh, Gizeni and the east basin of Kibuye. I am currently waiting my data of uh, trophic resource. So um, I have uh, used uh, the, da the data from uh, Bukavu, sampled by uh, Pascal Masilla in uh, 2011. Uh, let's talk about the results. The growth curve of Limnotrisa um, was produced due to the age estimate and the size measure. So at the age of uh, six months, the individuals uh, measure in average uh, 64 millimeters. And at the age of one year, um, the, they measure um, around uh, 95 millimeters. About uh, long practice curve, um, it is uh, under development. Here we compare um, um, the growth curve uh, based on autolith read reading and the curve uh, from uh, size frequency uh, distributions. Um, I am missing. Um, I am missing some data uh, of uh, size frequency. Therefore, uh, I will not present uh, present you my, my uh, curve. 
but I can show you um, the results from uh, two, uh, two authors using uh, the same, uh, the same uh, method on uh, Limnodrusa in the Lake uh, Kivu. Uh, they, um, he had blue curves. Um, Um, sorry. Here are blue, cur uh, blue curves uh, taken from uh, Canning Dini and Split Off. So, uh, growth rates um, are similar between the three curves, uh, and um, the growth of uh, Limnotrisa um, Sorry. Okay, uh, the growth of um, Limnotrisa um, doesn't seem seem to have changed uh, uh, since uh, the discovery of uh, Lampritis. The autolithometry uh, method um, is, um, is more adapted uh, to, um, to estimate uh, the age of uh, young individuals, and, uh, whereas uh, size frequency distribution is better to get um, a general trend of uh, the curve. About uh, isotopic results, um, <coughs> In red, uh, um, the, the, the niche of Limnotrisa is totally included in uh, Lamprechtis niche in uh, green. So uh, the, the niche of that is very important. And um, in the light of uh, the size um, of Lamprechtis niche, uh, this is uh, probably an opportunistic uh, species. The main uh, contributor um, of uh, fishes diet is uh, zooplankton, <coughs> uh, followed by uh, macroinvertebrates, which contribute to a quarter of uh, their diet. So um, the two species uh, have uh, a similar, um, a similar uh, feeding behavior. Then um, in in shore water, uh, both species occupy uh, the same uh, trophic position. And uh, when uh, Limnotrisa migrates in offshore water, they uh, uh, it keep, uh, keeps um, the same position. To conclude, um, the, uh, the role study uh, has been limited by uh, the methodological development of protocols and the experiments uh, time consuming. Um, soon we will be able to compare the, the growth of uh, the two species and to know if uh, Lamprechtis has um, a faster growth than um, Limnotrisa. In the light of uh, isotopic uh, results, the two species are in competition uh, for trophic uh, resource. Um, in inshore water, um, and the lampreys, uh, by the size of uh, of um, its niche, it uh, is qualified of uh, an opportunistic species. Future analyse um, um, will be made on fecundity rates. Um, main, meanwhile. Um, the study in Bukavu show um, Lampretis as a fecundity lower than that of Limnotrisa, but um, it can breed all year. At the end of uh, this study, uh, we will have uh, enough elements uh, to measure the impact of uh, Lampretis on Limnotrisa. If uh, Lampretis presents a better reproduction, a faster growth, and an opportunistic behavior, the measure may be taken to preserve the nutrition um, 
as issues to a social uh, issue. Thank you. Questions? Okay, thank you. Zingle, who will talk on having picnic under the waves, choosing between meadows and woods. <coughs> Dear listeners, I'm really glad for the opportunity to be here today. It has been a very interesting day, but it has also been a very long day, and I uh, promise to keep it short and keep it simple now. But first, I would like to really shortly introduce about what I'm going to talk and especially why I'm going to do it. When I choose a topic for this wonderful conference, I first thought, again, uh, what is all about actually? And uh, for me, being in the conference, it is uh, actually uh, telling different stories. Uh, stories uh, from the nature. And uh, I noticed that, that uh, in the present times, uh, when we are more and more surrounded by all kinds of um, flatters, believers, uh, wizard men, bearers, and all, uh, uh, others, this kind of wonderful uh, groups, uh, uh, we must be 
more and more better storytellers. Uh, otherwise, uh, our voice is lost. Nobody hears us and uh, our messages are completely lost. So we must do our best to uh, tell good stories. But uh, to tell a story, first we must put a message out of the nature. And for this reason we must uh, uh, understand the language of nature and we must be able to translate it. Uh, it, so it is understandable for all. Otherwise, we risk uh, the possibility that uh, we miss uh, the moment when the signs of nature become threatening. And uh, what is a very universal language? It is, it is nutrition. So I choose to talk about nutrition and uh, nutrition of larval and juvenile fish because fish is food, of course. And uh, my topic today is very briefly how habitat selection influences uh, the larval juvenile fish death, growth and uh, fate. Uh, to put it in other words, um, where to eat. Uh, quite often I go and have a picnic in nature with my friends and I have noticed that there are two groups. One group of my friends want to go to the woods. This, of course, here is uh, actually almost a uh, very shallow lake where are uh, very large microphytes growing. And the other uh, group of my friends, they want to go to the nice meadows and have there the picnic. When we translate it to the language of uh, lakes, as uh, woods are microphyte thickets and meadows are open water areas. And, uh, but life under the waves uh, is not a picnic always, especially when you are fish larvae. Fish larvae are quite uh, powerless, they are small, tiny, and they are constantly faced uh, by two perils, which are starvation and uh, predation. They must uh, choose very wisely uh, where to eat and where to be. Uh, of course, uh, in many cases, uh, it depends from the parents where the spawning has taken place because they are not very good swimmers at all. So, and what we did, we studied it in uh, Estonia, uh, quite big lake, uh, Lake Wiltser, this area, uh, oh, this area around uh, 270 square kilometers, and we sampled in the littoral zone, and in the open water areas. And here we, I am putting together data from 2013. And we carried out a parallel sampling of fish larvae and juveniles from both habitats and analyzed the fish fat contents using different microscopic methods, including uh, progressant microbes, micro, microscopy. And it is very tough work to work in natural as so, and we picked up uh, three species, uh, non, -predator, non predatory species roach, uh, a real predator, predator, pike, and then perch, uh, which in uh, juvenile stage is usually uh, not predatory, but then when it grows, it uh, starts to eat other uh, fish. So, three different uh, uh, fish. In this study. And uh, let's first look at the diet of first feeding larvae. Roach. Uh, what we noticed and what uh, makes our study a little bit uh, different is that we also uh, estimated the consumption of uh, planktonic ciliates. And here is uh, percentage of uh, fish larva carbon ingested uh, by larvae by day in percentages. And uh, we found quite a big difference between pelagial zone and littoral zone. But in both zones, the ciliates formed a very big part of the total larval diet. Uh, then the perch. The perch was a little bit uh, boring 
because there was no difference between the Bellagio and the littoral zone. They were very similar, and uh, what also Silia made up the most of the diet. And in the case of Pike, the ciliates were uh, least important, and again we found very similar results in both habitats. But let's uh, look a little bit closer uh, when uh, we are looking in uh, seasonal scale in spring and summer, what uh, translates again then for this larval stage and juvenile stage. Then, in the case of uh, uh, roach, uh, we found that uh, the most part is of uh, diabetes was made up by ciliates, but uh, in the pelagic bowl, the ciliates were a free swimming eoplanktonic species, but in the literal zone, most of them were attached uh, species. And uh, most common of uh, these species is, is the Pistulis procumbens, which grows on uh, microphytes and other substrata and uh, have these nice colonies. And it is quite easy to uh, these uh, young larvae to swim and pick uh, these uh, uh, cells up. From, this is colonies up from the stems. But in the summer times, uh, the taste for ciliates uh, disappeared. They started into uh, copper ports, clothers, and uh, in, uh, small insect larvae. And they were quite similar again in both the lateral and lateral zone. In case of perch, uh, there was not very big difference. Uh, the uh, all ciliates that they consumed were free skimmers and uh, they didn't uh, humiliate them to go to start picking something up from stems and in summer again not big differences between these two zones uh, most uh, food was made up by copper pools but it is a pike there were some differences in the uh, larval stage in uh, Pelagial, though no reward, uh, little the more ciliates was consumed, but this is a uh, very little difference. But things uh, went interesting in the juvenile stage, because in the open water area, the main uh, food items were copper pots, but in the littoral, they were. Uh, larval fish and uh, human and fish, but not in the glacial zone. And the uh, main reason, I believe, was that uh, in the glacial zones, uh, just the number of uh, this young fish was very small. They couldn't find them there, but there were plenty of them in the littoral zone. So they could make this uh, switch to the uh, fish diet. And this uh, was very clearly seen also in the pike uh, condition. These, uh, these uh, guys who lived in uh, amongst uh, microphytes uh, fared quite well and went fatter and fatter. But the uh, group uh, who lived in the open water, they just disappeared. Uh, they uh, went thinner and thinner and then uh, uh, there was end of them. There was no more of them in the open water. The perch, there was very little differences in the two, uh, two of those. And uh, for roach, uh, these uh, literal zone roaches a little bit better, and this, uh, this uh, difference remained. And uh, how it translates to the total length, this is pipe in. Uh, in uh, open water and in later of the own. and yes there is this end for this uh, population here uh, these are uh, roaches vegetation roaches and open water roaches and perches no big difference among these guys which uh, seemed uh, in this case to be very tolerant to different conditions and very wise -ish. So we saw here three strategies uh, for predatory fish. They had fastest growth and habitat selection was crucial. 
when they go into speech to the fish diet, they just uh, perished. Uh, to the non predatory fish, uh, they had slow growth, and uh, habit selection was important. These uh, roaches that uh, live amongst the vegetation were a little bit uh, more, uh, they were bigger and they were very fatter. But of course, you must uh, remember that uh, in the uh, vegetation zone, there was these uh, predatory fishes. You got a little bit more food there, but there was a risk to, uh, that the pikes are going to eat you also. And uh, for the uh, non predatory fish, that, uh, like, like um, birds that would, would be predatory fish, they had medium crows, and, and habitat selection was least important. So, uh, what would be take home message from all of this. I would say that uh, fish had, has feelings, don't forget that. And they are really, uh, fish larvae are really vulnerable uh, uh, to the changes in their habitat. But what uh, my main message is here is probably that we still know uh, very uh, precious little about uh, larval fish feeding at, and uh, when we want to understand how they interact with the food waves and how food waves uh, interact with the uh, uh, fish here with strength, then we must uh, have little more knowledge about this. Those are my um, acknowledgements and thank you for your attention. Questions? Were they, they were eating both roach and perch, or did you, did you identify the type of uh, fish? Uh, yes, uh, there were bikes, there were roach, there were other species present also. We, I just showed here three species, but there are of course more species present. And in the end, uh, they also consumed uh, these small bites. Uh, probably what I think what happened is that uh, uh, in some time, in this uh, summer, the, these um, open water um, bites, uh, young bites invade its uh, littoral zone uh, to, to find more food and then they were just eaten by the other because I found a lot of these uh, small uh, eaten bites in, in uh, the stomach. stomach. I have a question too. When you saw the proportions of yes. uh, diet for the different fishes, it was a number of individuals or a No, it, 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 it is biomass. Oh, biomass. Okay. Sorry, I didn't mention oh, okay, it. Okay, okay. Good. <laughs> Thanks. It's biomass. So you think, um, the, I think a, the idea for a lot of people might be that young fish would move into more vegetated areas to avoid predation or escape predation because there's more shelter there? But in your system, you think there's actually more predation on young fish in the more structured area? Yes, I think that it is quite tricky. And they must be constantly searching for the balance uh, to find shelter, to find food. And uh, what is the best place? <coughs> it depends uh, hugely what is the condition there. And of course, it depends.